welcome to the second day of the symposium. Uh, and now I invite Professor Shankar uh, Ramakrishnan from our department uh, to chair this session on digital medicine. And so Shankar uh, was the uh, previous head of the BSV department and he has been one of the uh, very actively involved in the MFCM initiative from the very beginning. And he has also known our keynote speaker, Professor Shankar, uh, for a long time. So there is a personal connection there as well. So without further ado, I invite uh, Shankar to come on stage and introduce the speaker. Thank you, Nitin. Um, so I would like to welcome all of you to the, for the first session of uh, MFCM inaugural symposium. And the first speaker of uh, digital medicine session is uh, very aptly Professor Shankar Subramanian. And uh, for most of us, uh, he is not new. We know him. We know about Shankar. And uh, his connection to IIT Kanpur goes back to several decades. And I am very happy to introduce him. And uh, Shank Professor Shankar Subramanyam is a distinguished professor of bioengineering, bioinformatics, and systems biology, computer science and engineering, cellular and molecular medicine, and nanoengineering <coughs> at UCSD. Professor Subramanyam has played a key role in raising national awareness for training and research in bioinformatics. He served as a member of the National Institute for Health, NIH Director's Advisory Committee on Bioinformatics. In 2008, he was awarded the Faculty Excellence in Research Award at the University of California at San Diego. In 2011, he was appointed as a distinguished scientist at San Diego Supercomputing Center. Dr. Subramanyam has served on the external advisory board for several bio and biomedical <coughs> engineering departments including Johns Hopkins, uh, Case Western Reserve, UPenn, Georgia Tech, Rice University and University of Texas, Austin. Dr. Subramanyam has also served on Bioinformatics and Biotechnology Advisory Council for Virginia Tech, the University of Illinois at Chicago and on the Scientific Advisory Board of several biotech and bioinformatics companies. He is currently an overseas advisor for the Department of Biotechnology of the Government of India and a member of European Science Foundation panel. So with this introduction, I would like to invite Professor Shankar Subramanyam to deliver his lecture. Thank you, um, Shankar. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you're sick of me by now. I've been on occupying this podium for a long time yesterday and this morning. I promise you, after this talk, I will vanish from the podium, at least. And so, uh, welcome, everyone. And so, this morning, I wanted to tell you about uh, ongoing work in my lab uh, for the last several years. And uh, our interest was, I'll tell you in a little bit of story-like line, how our interest was kindled in this area and why we do this research. And I'll give you a brief uh, overview of this. So this is uh, the goal of my talk here to tell you about how is the brain reprogrammed in Alzheimer's disease and how we could really delve into this using digital medicine. By digital medicine, I mean large volumes of data measured by multiple modalities. So I'm going to tell you about that in a few minutes. So like uh, Gong, uh, Dr. Gong Bao did yesterday, funding from many, many sources. I have nine NIH grants and uh, foundation grants and all that, which makes this possible for me to do the kinds of work. We work in multiple areas of research in systems biology and systems medicine, but I'm going to only talk today about neuropathologies, and this is focused entirely on Alzheimer's disease today. And so what is Alzheimer's disease? I mean, this is something that most of us, if you live long enough, we are going to get dementia at some level or the other. We'll lose some, I mean, brain cells. We keep losing brain cells. Eventually, some, some of us will end up or some people end up in getting Alzheimer's disease, which is a specific 
type of extended dementia. I'll tell you all about it in a minute. And the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is that you have shrunken brain size, dying neuron with tangles, plaques, you know, formation of big plaques in the brain. And this is kind of the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. The time people detect it is they start losing memory, but most of us don't admit that we are losing memory. Even if you, if I go to, yeah, for, for, I'm sure losing a lot of things, don't for, I forget things, but I'm not going to go regularly and check myself to see if I have Alzheimer's disease. So by the time people find out that they have AD, it's too late. You know, I mean, it's by the time, and the way they find out is uh, they start forgetting things more and more and more. You go to do cognitive tests and the cognitive tests lead to some kind of imaging and when you do imaging, you find your plaques and tangles, and that's when you realize that you have Alzheimer's disease. Okay, I mean, that's one modality. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of story. Let me start with the story. So what is, this is some kind of a map of the world, and I put dots randomly. It looks like I put dots randomly in different places. What, do this, what makes these dots related to each other, and what is the meaning of this? So I'm going to give you a small story about this. I'm going to focus on one dot, which is actually in, uh, in Italy, and in fact, if I zoom in on this region, I'm going to get this region, a province called province called Catanzaro. And when you look at the Google map of Catanzaro, what you're going to see is this map of a place. This is Catanzaro, the red highlighted region. And there's a place called Girifalco, a small town. I think this is not working anymore. And in case you want to fix it. I can just use my hand. So the on, one highlight of this place is you got to see in, in this is I'm not I didn't write this down. This is in the map. There's something called Ospedale Psychiatrico in the Girifalco, which is a psychiatric hospital of Girifalco. What's so special about this hospital? So it turns out that this hospital started in 1640, in the year 1640. It was not a hospital. It was started by a priest. Because there are a lot of there are a group of people who are demented and who are called crazy, mad, psychotic, all those things. So they kept the records of all these people. So this is a set of families, a few families. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So they just kept a record of these families, and and so it turns out that this record has continued for a long time. And what's the relationship with this record? So if you go to now, the slide thing is not working, but that's okay. Is there, is there a way I can move it here in any other way? Sorry about that, folks. So I'll tell you the story while he's pulling it up. So it turns out that now turn the clock forward to 1904. In 1904, I think this is not connected to that, this, this yeah, thing connected. here. No, it's, connected. it's connected now. It's not moving. Just change the battery in this, that's all. If you change the battery in the other one. Okay, so I mean, let's, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're having technical issues, but don't worry about it. I'll tell you the story and then you'll see the slide after that. So in 1904, there's a person whose uh, name, who, who was found, whose records, these records were maintained for a long time, but it turns out that this person's record was indicative of a mutation in a given gene and this one mutation in the given gene, and for this I want to show you this because it's a really exciting story. And it was published actually more recently. Uh, I'll give Nitin a chance to. Thank you, Nitin. I think this should work. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm often technologically Sorry. challenged, but this is even Sorry. beyond me. Okay. Ah, fantastic. So this is the picture of the hospital in Girifalco. And you can see that this is very ancient. In fact, this record is the record of Angela R. And you can see this record is 1905. You can see the date here. And this record tells you about this person's uh, in afflictions. It just describes the afflictions of this person. So turn the clock back to 2014. They had sample of this individual. They dug up a sample of this individual. They could sequence this individual. 
right? And they found out that the sequence showed that it's, she had a familial case of Alzheimer's disease, which means that she had a mutation in one of the genes which showed that she had Alzheimer's disease. And Alua Alzheimer, in the same time frame, 1904, was the first one to recognize that there is a set of diseases of the brain associated with neurodegeneration, which is which which called after him as Alzheimer's disease. Now let's turn back the clock. Let's look at the history. If you look at, trace back the origin of uh, this individual's family, you can see that everything in dark is affected patients. So if the gene was derived with, from the parent, the person was affected with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, the gene was derived from the patient. So in fact, this family, which is why this region in this place, the fam whole family, the Gary Falco Hospital has a record from 1640 until today of the family members who are affected by diseases. They were called by different names and different things and so forth. Now let's go back to the map. It turns out that the, there are people in, in Melbourne, Australia, and Buenos Aires, Argentina, these red dots, these members had exactly the same mutation in the same gene. And when they traced back their ex where they originated from, they didn't know that they were of Italian origin from Catanzaro. But when they traced back the origin, they found out that they were exactly, they migrated, their ancestors had migrated. Without new genomes, whole genome sequencing, they were able to find out that they were related. And that's what relates all these dots. For example, patients here, 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 and here, they have the same type of mutation. Different, I mean, different from the Angela R mutation. These people here have the same mutation and so forth. So these are all mutations in just three genes. In fact, I'm going to show you those three genes. Those, uh, maybe I didn't uh, uh, get them here. I have it here. These genes, which are all coming from presenilin 1, presenilin 2, or APP. These are the three genes. If there are mutations, specific mutations in those genes, it's a question of not if you are going to get Alzheimer's disease, it's a question of when you are going to get Alzheimer's disease. They are 100% penetrant disease genes, okay? So now let's go forward a little bit. What's the problem with AD? AD is the leading cause of, sixth leading cause of death in the US. 5.8 million Americans are living with AD. One in 10 people of age 65 and older have AD. By 2020, AD and related dementia will cost $305 billion. By 2050, it's $1.1 trillion. That's the cost for Alzheimer's disease. Older African Americans are twice as likely to have AD than older Caucasians. After investments of tens of billions of dollars, I mean, NIH has invested, I mean, several tens of billions of dollars in public money. There's not a single cure for Alzheimer's disease, okay? There's absolutely nothing. So the Disease I told you about is called familial Alzheimer's disease. Turns out that people who are old, like 75, 80, and 85, also get Alzheimer's disease without this single mutations, right? Which means there must be a genetic background in these people, which is causing the Alzheimer's disease and dementia and Alzheimer's disease, correct? In fact, uh, in if you look at the Indian I mean, population now. In fact, I was talking to somebody in, who works on neurodegeneration from Bangalore, from Nimhans in Bangalore. They said in Indian population, they don't even recognize because people didn't live that long to know that they had, I mean, AD. And now it's starting to show that people have dementia and AD. So it turns out that sporadic AD, which is what it, is, it goes by, is actually more common. It's greater than 65 years. And familial AD, which I told you about, is the one that is less than 65. In fact, I'll show you the age group. The age group is, I'm sorry, I should have it in the next slide. The age group is uh, 45 years, 58 years, 47 years, 51 years. That's kind of the plus or minus age group. And most of these people die within 10 years after they have 80. So this is really the familial Alzheimer's disease. And the mutations I told you about are in this one, in these three genes, in presenilin 1, which is this simple protein here, presenilin 2, or APP, which is a substrate for these proteins. And these are the mutations mapped in red. Anytime you have those, that kind of a mutation, and now we can all do 23andMe genome sequencing, and we can figure out, hey, do we have that mutation? In which case, what can we do about changing our lifestyle? So this is really 
the hallmark of uh, this. Now, the question that often is asked, first question that was asked was, why is this gene causing, why is the mutation this gene causing Alzheimer's disease? Let's look, try to answer that question. So this is what I told you about previously. So let me go back to the brain of AD. This is healthy brain. This is Alzheimer's brain. It's got plaques and tangles. What are these plaques? These plaques are nothing but misfolded proteins, which are just simply having these peptides, which are processed by the protein I told you about. That processing gives rise to aberrant processing. And when you have an aberrant processing, they aggregate. And these aggregations, oligomers, they perform these aggregate. These are amyloid plaques, and they call fibrils, amyloid fibrils. They are 100 nanometers. They're thicker and thicker. They grow in the brain. They kill the cells, and eventually you lose your memory and so forth. This was a thought that was going around till about 20 years ago, till 15 years ago, or five years ago, when people thought that amyloids were the cause of the death. So since 1960, the amount of money invested in amyloid research, amyloid-based drug research, is billions of dollars in public funding and multiples of billions of tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars by pharmaceutical industry, right? Let's see what happens. So I'm going to tell you the story from Eli Lilly, which is a pharmaceutical company that is, and Eli Lilly invested $3 billion in AD therapeutics. This is from Illinois, I mean, Indiana Business Journal. And you can see that they invested $3 billion in AD therapeutics. Okay. They did a phase three trial of a drug called semigesistat for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And this trial went on for 20 years till 2015. Then they showed in, in New York Times, an article appeared in 20s, I don't remember exactly, 2015, let me see what it is, here it is. I can't read very well from there, 2010. It was shown that Lilly stops Alzheimer's disease drug trials. And they published this in the New England Journal of Medicine. The trial said the placebo, as compared to placebo, semigesistat did not improve the cognitive status and patients receiving higher dose had a worsening of functional ability. However, I want to tell you the plaques were gone. In fact, when they did imaging, there were no plaques, right? But they didn't recover memory. So the question is, why is it that you, know, you dissolve plaques, you get rid of them, but you don't get back your memory? What's the problem? So now there are other companies, for example, there are six companies, Roche, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Biogenetic, Genentech, Lilly, all of them did drugs which are based on plaques, and all of them failed. And in fact, this there's an article in Nature Reviews that Alzheimer's failure raises questions about modifying strategies. And the ultimate journal, Forbes, said amyloid hypothesis is dead. So, which really means that you don't you don't assume that amyloids are going to cause the thing. So this kind of prompted us. So why are these drugs a failure? So this is the reason I'm going to tell you for students who are here. You have to always have a passion or a question that you ask, and then you try to address that question in the ways that you can think about. So the question was, why do these drugs fail? Why, why are Alzheimer's drug discoveries a failure? So the first thing you should know is, we don't have good model systems. You know, if you have diabetes, if you have liver disease, you have mouse, good models, they're great models, right? If you have brain disorders, Alzheimer's disease, mice don't get Alzheimer's disease. Monkeys, primates don't get Alzheimer's disease we get Alzheimer's disease. So therefore, this is really a big issue, right? There are no good models. And we cannot interrogatively investigate the human brain. There's no way to do it. So therefore, there's no good model systems. That's the first issue. Second issue, we attack the wrong mechanisms, removing plaques. In fact, we had an intu I had an intuition years ago that the reason why all these drugs are a failure is because it's too late in the game by the time you get plaques. And we said, why is it the case? So this is, So the mechanisms are wrong. So our goal was to find out what are the mechanisms which will address the disease. The third question is, even when you do find a target, let's say you find a target and you have a drug, how do you screen? I mean, you cannot give the drug to a human being and FDA will never let you inject the drug into your brain to see if you're going to survive or you're going to do better. So there's no good way of screening. So our goal was, we said, okay, we want to bring engineering approaches towards these problems. This is the goal. This I was telling you yesterday that engineering is really coming into focus in terms of human pathologies. So make personalized brain organoids. So we said, okay, what if I do the following? What if I take my brain 
and make an avatar of my brain. Can I do it? The answer is yes. Today we can do an avatar of our brain to some extent and see how it behaves. So that's the number one question. Second is we want to develop a drug reactor screening. We want to have a high throughput robotic automated way of screening. So these avatars, we can screen them for all the drugs and show that they work. That's a good starting point. Then FDA will say, okay, we'll give you approval for doing clinical trials. Third, we want to have quantitative assessments and we want to target the right mechanisms. So the next half hour, I'm going to walk you through all this story of how we came through with this process. I'll go through some slides very fast because it's more technology than anything else, but some slides I'll walk through slowly to give you the idea. So here's the uh, way of we started thinking about it. We said, okay, what if I get, take my skin and get stem cells from my skin, convert the stem cells into neurons? They'll be more my neurons or your neuron because it'll be individualized and personalized. Right, I have the same genetic background. So I make these neurons. Let me see how different are these neurons from the neuron of patients who have an Alzheimer's mutation. Okay, the question is very simple. We take mutations, we take neurons from people who have these familial mutations, we take a non-demented control patient neuron, we compare the two to see are these neurons similar, how do they evolve and so forth. That's the first question, that's a model system. Now the question will come about, okay, it's great that you're creating a stem cell derived neuron, but what about uh, um, uh, the brain is more complex than single cells, so therefore you need to have something more. So that, okay, we can make organoids out of these things, which means we can take these neurons, build them into complex organoids that contain neurons, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, the entire cell population of the brain, make it look like a mini brain, and then now we can look at the disease in more order. So this is, this is our solution, engineering solution, and I'll walk you through how we implement this and all those things. Second, we want to ask the question, if I take these neurons, can I find out how they are different? This is where data comes into picture. We do millions of different experiments to give you millions of pieces of data, which tell you how these two neurons are different. We do transcriptional, see transcriptomic sequencing, which means we want to look at how they are different at uh, the uh, expression of genes. We want to look at epigenetics. We want to look at how the chromatin is folded in these neurons. I want to look at what mechanisms are implicated in the Alzheimer's brain. Okay, so this was a quest of what we set out to do. And then we could build a reactor-like system here where we can take the library of compounds we can then screen this library of compounds against these neurons or against the organoids. So we can really do a high throughput way of saying, hey, what drugs work? What combinations of drugs work? I'll give you an example of this as we go along. So this is our goal. So the first paper we published was a long time ago in 2020 in our dictionary. So we showed that the reason why all the Alzheimer's drugs based on plaques failed was because they attacked the wrong mechanism. It's way too late. The first things that happen is that the neurons undergo de-differentiation. In fact, Gang was referring to it yesterday in some of his studies as well. So what do you mean by de-differentiation? That means the neurons, they are no longer neurons. They lose their neuron-ness. As a consequence, they lose synaptic connections. We are who we are because of our brain's ability to connect and fire. And so if you lose our synaptic connections, then we lose memory. That makes sense, right? So therefore we lose memory. And then it goes through a whole series of processes. So our first goal was to find out what are the mechanisms that are different between a normal, non-demented control human being. In fact, we took extreme case of an 85 year old person who was completely cognitively normal to make it as contrasting as possible. Then we took these Alzheimer's patient samples and then we transformed them into neurons and looked at what's different between the two. So the next 10 minutes, I'll tell you the story of this thing. So we looked at all these different mutations. They're all familial Alzheimer's patients who all have Alzheimer's disease. They are different families. In fact, one of these families is the family of Angela R, who had the defect from, uh, uh, from Girifalco's hospital from Catanzaro. So we, one of this was from that family patient. So we took all these different mutations and then we transform these into neurons. And then we try to look at what is the effect of those. And I'm going to tell you first the story about all the presenlin one mutations. 
In fact, they are the most lethal mutations because they have the shortest lifespan, uh, presenilin 1. Presenilin 2 is next, and APP is third. First, we, I'll show you presenilin 1, <coughs> then I'll walk you into presenilin 2 and APP. Okay, so our goal is very simple. We just take these neurons. Thanks to Yamanaka factors, we can transform them into human-induced pluripotent cells. And uh, one of my colleagues developed a technology where you can transform them into neurons greater than 90% and glial cells. So we transformed all of these into neurons. Let's see what happens. So we use technology, crazy amounts of technology, RNA sequencing, chip sequencing, met methylation sequencing, and uh, we are still doing high C, but we did ATAC sequencing. We did all these kinds of different sequencing. And you don't understand the magnitude or amount of data if I don't tell you. It's just enormous amounts of data. And so this is where the digital medicine comes into picture, where we are talking about. So this is our first idea of, to give you, a, first, a high-level view. All these com combined approaches towards various uh, sequencing approaches told us a simple story. It said, in the disease case, you have dedifferentiation, which means you're no longer a neuron, or neurons come from a germ layer called ectoderm. You're no longer ectodermal. You start behaving like you're a confused cell. And so therefore, you're no longer a neuronal cell. And so then you have cell cycle re-entry. You know, once we form our brains, our brains are terminal, we reach terminal state of cell cycle. We don't cell cycle. Our brains don't reproduce themselves, right? So there are, I mean, neuronal cells don't reproduce. However, this neuronal cells from Alzheimer's patients showed like as if they are going through a cell cycle. Okay, so then the third thing is there's neuron lineage repression. Neuron lineage, things that were canonically called neurons, their genes, they were downregulated. And synaptic function loss, this is the most important thing. We lose synapse like crazy, which means all memory is slowly going away in these patients, okay? So then he said, okay, so I don't want to walk you through this slide. It's a very complex slide. So our goal was to look at all these different presenilin in one patients. We asked the question, okay, if you did it in one cell, then somebody will come and tell you, hey, you know, this is such a special case that you're looking at. You're not looking at uh, the general case of what's going to happen in all these cells. So we said, okay, we'll look at four different presenilin in one patients, and we'll look at what's common amongst all of them. And when we look at what's common amongst all of them, I just want to give you a high-level view they become pluripotent, which means they're no longer neurons. They look like more like stem cells than like neurons. And second, they go through cell cycle. They start cell cycle. They have inflammation. They have down-regulating neuronal specification. That means the neuronal, anything that's neuron-like is down-regulated. For example, glutaminergic receptors and GABA receptors, neuron-specific channels, they're all down-regulated. And then you have uh, um, uh, de-differentiation which is upregulated, which is essentially you're going back into something. When I say de-differentiation, what I mean is you're going back away, back towards a reverse direction from being a neuron. Okay. I said, okay, all right. So what, what can we do about it if we find this? We find all these specific targets of cell cycle, pluripotency, de-differentiation, neuron specification. So now we have a handle on what goes wrong in the brain. And it's not one thing that goes wrong. There are about half a dozen things that we can think of as going wrong. How do you fix it? I'll walk you through that in a few minutes. Before we do that, this is actually a more complex way of looking at it. Who regulates these changes? Who regulates these changes are these genes. They're all transcription factors or regulators. For example, everything in red, orange, yellow is increasing. Everything in green is decreasing. So these are the regulating or controlling factors. Can we control them? Can we use drugs to look at these things? Okay, I'll show you examples of how we can think about it. So cell cycle is an example, and I'm going to skip this slide mostly except to tell you, we know the precise mechanism by which these cells enter this cell cycle. Imagine this mutation here, presenilin 1. This is uh, now essentially what it does is it takes a protein, breaks it down in the wrong way. As a consequence, it re-enters the cell cycle and then it goes into cell cycle, but doesn't complete it, stops somewhere here. So we know precisely the mechanism of how the cell cycle is regulated, for example. So let me go to the next slide. So the next question then that came to us, you, you try to publish such things, they will tell you, you have to know why it happens. It's not sufficient to just show that it happens. Okay, why does it happen? So okay, I had this idea. The cell state is changing, which means the cell is going away from being a neuron into a non-neuronal state. What does it mean? It means that the, the cell's directions, 
where it tells you what genes you express to be a cell, that's, that is changing. And how do you know how to dis determine how that is changing? The, what decides the state of a cell is the chromatin state, state of the chromosomes, and it's folded and opened and all that. Yesterday, I think I told you, in, in, if you take uh, the entire chromosome two meters long, you compact it into a 100 micron nucleus, then you're really going to be compacted. So which means some parts are open, some parts are closed. And this is what decides whether you're a cardiomyocyte or whether you're a neuron or whether you're a skin cell and things like that. So we ask the question, how is the chromatin changing? There's a beautiful direct set of experiments you can do to look at chromatin landscape. And this set of experiments essentially is called uh, the chromatin accessibility ataxic measurements. You can look at how the chromatin shape changes by locally mapping, is it open or closed? Okay, it's a very simple question. Open region or closed region? If it is closed, it cannot express a gene. If it is open, it can express a gene. Now, if it turns out that in the neurons, you have genes, neuronal genes are expressed, that means that region must be open. If an Alzheimer's neuron, if you don't express the genes, that region must be closed. If the answer to this is yes, then we have a hypothesis that the chromatin determines the control of who is expressing and who is not expressing exactly what we see. In fact, uh, forget the slide. So when we look at all the complex analysis of this, the analysis simply tells you exactly the same thing. In an Alzheimer's neuron, you lose chromatin accessibility for what's a neuron. You lose gain chromatin accessibility for what's a non-neuron as a consequence express genes which are non-neuron-like. And you close regions, which are synaptic genes, so you no longer have synaptic gene expression. As a consequence, you don't have synapses anymore. Okay, so that's what gives rise to dementia. So we now have a mechanism. To corroborate and to ver verify this, we actually looked at it. We looked at open and closed regions of chromatin through this experiment called uh, um, uh, CHIP-seq. That is, you can actually use a protein to pull down the regions that are open and closed, in, you look at the histones, and then you can say, hey, it's open or closed. When we did that, we got exactly the same result, which is, which is essentially, we looked at the regions which are open and regions that are closed, and I'll show you that we precisely showed that there's a strong overlap between open and closed regions and the regions that are open and closed through another experiment. So we are corroborating that this is exactly what happens. Now we said, okay. So when we tried to publish this paper first in a high profile journal, they said this is fantastic. However, you're doing it in a neuron derived from a stem cell. What about in the human brain? In the human brain, does the same thing happen? So we are so lucky that we got a postmortem human brains which had mutations in exactly the same region. Right? So we're able to do this experiment, and I'll show you in a minute. Are these same in, in vivo patient data? So we looked at patients. We looked at common genes between the postmortem brain and the neuron samples. Guess what? When we did this experiment, we did exactly the same program. Look at the comparison so stark here between these are the mutations. This is the, this is the brain, M139T. This is a human brain sample. You can look at how similar pluripotency, dedifferentiation, cell cycle, neuronal specification are. The same things happen in the human brain. Right? So therefore, this is really convincing that it is not just we are just doing a cell experiment that is happening in the human brain. Okay, so then we showed, what is, how do we explain the mechanism? So we published the paper where we showed that these things, these regions in the normal brain, like all of your brains, are open or closed here, and these are open, so which is why your brain functions so beautifully, controlled by these samples. However, when you go to an Alzheimer's brain, Guess what? Everything goes all right. All those regions that were originally closed, originally open, became closed. All those regions that were originally closed became open. And so as a consequence, your cell state is no longer a neuron. It is something else. Okay? Now let me continue here. So he said this is our kind of a high-level view of what happens. You go from a stem cell into a normal brain. This is our terminal neuron. When we are children, this is what happens in the Alzheimer's disease, you go back into a precursor-like cell, which kind of is no longer in no man's land or no person land, which means that you don't know whether you're a neuron or not a neuron. Okay, fantastic. So he said, okay. Then came the next question. What about mutations 
which are, we did presenilin 1. What about presenilin 2 and APP? They also give Alzheimer's disease, familial Alzheimer's disease. What about those mutations? He said, okay, we said, well, I'm gonna walk very quickly through this. So we said, okay, we look at, we published this paper, this is in molecular psychiatry. And so it shows that systems level analysis shows exactly the same thing. We looked at common regions between all these different mutations and look at what happens. The end result, believe me when I tell you this, the end result is <coughs> the same regions, the same things happen. There's a loss of neuronal specification. There's a gain in pluripotency, loss of synaptic connections, the same things happen. Okay, so we are convinced that this is published. We are convinced that this is really happening. So I'm going to skip these slides. It's all the complex you can tell us. But we did something slightly more interesting than that. So, okay, when you take all these mutations, some of these patients die earlier, some of these patients die later. Some are more severe, some are less severe. Can we predict this severity of disease from all this beautiful data that we are getting? The answer is yes. In fact, when you look at this data, we show neuronal function it goes from here to here, decreases. Guess what? The lowest neuronal function are the ones which are the earliest dyers, I mean, people who die most early. Then you've got, and every single function that you look at, every single function you look at, we have a pseudo trajectory or a pseudo map of saying which patient is going to benefit or which patient is going to die soon, which patient is going to die later. Okay, fantastic. So we have, this is our model. So we say that this is, uh, um, let me see, yeah. This is your uh, 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 going into a synaptic regular neuron. In the case of the Alzheimer's disease, you have different stages. Some of them are less severe, less severe, more severe. They go into more precursor-like state. And so we now have a map of all these things where we can show exactly what happens to this brain. Let's go further. Then the question came. Then when we submitted all of this, I, I gave a talk in some big institution and they said, hey, this is all great, but this is familial Alzheimer's disease. What about Alzheimer's disease of patients who are 70 years old or 80 years old and who get Alzheimer's disease? They don't have these mutations. And we don't know what mutations they have. So what about these patients? So we said, okay, we are very lucky that in UC San Diego, we have a Alzheimer's uh, core from NIH. And we have a lot of patient samples, postmodern brain samples. We got 49 postmodern brain samples. And we took these brain samples in three different regions of the brain of these postmortem dead people samples. And then we analyzed these samples, the same technology using transcriptomic measurements. When we did that, we showed it was more complex, more, more heterogeneous, more confusing or more things were happening. However, what was common was the differentiation, which means they were no longer neurons. They stopped behaving like neurons. We had increased inflammation and all that. So we published this in this journal called Molecular Brain. And we showed that exactly same things happen. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see this. You show that neuronal function, lineage function is altered. Then there's altered lineage and the chromatin pluripotency and inflammation increased. So this was the first time somebody had shown that there is similarity between the induced pluripotent stem cell derived data and human brain data, not just only in familial AD, but also in sporadic AD. So now it, I answered the first question, can we build a model system? Yes. Can we find the molecular mechanisms associated with the model system? Yes. Can we now do drugs? So that's the next question, right? Therapeutics. So you said, first you said, okay, why did the Lilly drug fail? So the first question you ask is, why did the Lilly drug fail? I mean, it's after all supposed to went through 15 years of phase two clinical trials. Why did it fail? So we said, okay, let's do the following. Let's take this, induce pluripotent stem cell derived neurons from familial Alzheimer's patients. Let's treat them with a Lilly drug. And for comparison, we'll treat them with another drug. Let's see whether the drug fixes the problems I saw in these neurons. If it fixes the problems, then it's a great drug, at least a starting point. If it doesn't fix, then we know why it failed. The answer is very simple. We did all kinds of complex experiments. I won't go into detail. How, how, much, how am I doing on time? I don't have a concept of time ever. Do I have another 20 minutes? 15 minutes, okay. So I'll just show you one thing. So therefore, when we did the experiment, first we did the experiments in terms of titration of these things. We showed that uh, the, if you use a Lilly drug, Lilly drug removes any ability, it removes all of the uh, 
processed APP peptides, all the A, B, R, 40, 38, 39, everything. So it really uh, removes. So that's okay, you know, except that we had another drug which removes only some of them, which is better. And so we said, okay, let's compare these drugs and see what happens. But nevertheless, the bottom line is that the response of the drugs targeting downregulate cell cycle, remember I told you it goes back into cell cycle? These drugs do great in terms of regulating cell cycle. They remove plaques. They essentially, some non, they don't have plaques anymore, so they remove plaques. But they don't do anything to the synapse. They don't restore your brain connection connectivity. Since they don't restore your brain connectivity, you're going to end up continuing to have dementia, right? We showed this elegantly. We showed this through a complex set of experiments using these gamma secretase drug targets. And we showed that the bottom line of all of this is very simple. I'm going to summarize this for you. We published this paper already in a journal called Alzheimer's and Dementia. And we showed that in the normal case, you're going into this, uh, into this. this is a normal case where you go from precursor into differentiated neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, you go into this state, in this bottom state, and you can go into intermediate stages. You can go into this stage with the Eli Lilly drug. You can go into this stage, but you'll never go back to this stage where you're completely restored the neurons. So therefore, we know that these mechanisms are not addressed by these drugs. Okay, next question. Can we address it by any other mechanisms to look at drugs? So we said, okay. We decided to look at the following. So let's take all the FDA-approved drugs. Let's take the drugs that are connected, targeted against uh, brain function, brain diseases, Parkinson's and all those diseases. So we are going to really do a workflow of drug pathway identification, and then we're going to take this and look at drug target identification. We are going to combine these things, and then we are going to look at what drugs can we try to look at these things. So when we look at this co complex analysis, we showed that when you look at drugs that are involved in neurogenesis, drugs involved in synaptic plasticity, neurotransmitter receptor drugs, inflammation drugs, all these drugs, we take a combination of all these drugs and pathways, and then we try to build a complex machinery where we can look at all the predicted drugs, all the drugs we think might work. I mean, this is all computer stuff yet. It's not really, I mean, in experimental stuff. So we predict all this stuff. We look at, uh, in fact, we look at the predicted candidates found from chromatin accessibility. We find these are key drugs which we could try it. And right now we are screening all these drugs in singly and in combination so that we can go and look at what drugs work and what drugs don't work. So that's where we're at. Now comes an interesting question. We have Alzheimer's disease starts in some region in the brain. How does it spread? Is it the same in all the regions in the brain? Is it going to be unique to some regions? Can we fix drugs if you have drugging? Can we target it to specific regions of the brain? Or is it going to be entire brain? So to address this question, we are very fortunate that we got, this is not, this, the original data generation was not in my lab for this. This was done already by somebody, but they just looked at it for uh, some other reason. We got the data from six different regions of the brain. And in fact, we looked at um, uh, enterorhinal complex, uh, hippocampus, mediotemporal gyrus, parietal complex, uh, SFG, and I mean, visual cortex. We looked at all these different regions of the brain. And we're able to map the same thing, the transcriptomic map of these different regions of the brain to see which regions are more similar, more cause earlier effect and all that. And so when we did the comparison of each of these regions, we showed that in fact, very similar mechanisms exist in many of them, but some more in others. For example, in all the, in the cortex regions, we had a greater effect of these mutations than in other regions. So we are now not only able to look at the mechanisms that are faulty in the brain, but we are able to localize them to different parts of the brain. In fact, now, as we speak, we are doing single cell sequencing in brain organoids, which can tell us exactly what regions of the brain initiate the process. We are not there yet. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this slide. So now comes the next interesting question. These mechanisms are great in Alzheimer's disease. What about Parkinson's disease? What about Huntington's disease? What about ALS? Are there similar mechanisms? So I said, okay, we'll investigate them. So I had a very sharp student who said, okay, I'm going to really take on this job. I'm going to look at Parkinson's brain data. And uh, in Parkinson's brain, many of you know that uh, we have uh, defects in uh, substantia negra, and we have, uh, again, we have formation of plaques, 
Parkinson's disease brain has essentially formation of plaques due to a specific set of proteins. Huntington's brain has similar things in terms of uh, brain regions which are affected at the next slide. Huntington's brain has also defects in basal ganglia, which forms these repeats called CAG repeats. We said, okay, let's take these comparisons and see what happens in these brains. And this student of mine fits, uh, he took all these different data sets from patient replicates from, from Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and he did a comparative analysis of all these things. And guess what he found? Very simple. He found that the mechanisms are in all these cases, Huntington's, uh, this is uh, um, Parkinson's, and then we have also ALS. All these cases, chromatin gets remodeled, just like we saw in Alzheimer's. Cell cycle reentry happens. Neuron specification goes down, and de differentiation goes up, and then immune response goes up. Essentially, the same process, phenomenon, underlying phenomenon. So now comes the more interesting question. Why is this the case? So let me tell you, before I say why is this the case, let me tell you the story. So right now we are in the process of building organoids, cortical organoids, and we have a paper in Nature Protocols under final review. And I, I lost, my, I'm sorry, um, I lost my um, slide here. For some reason, the slide doesn't show up here. So the bottom line is we now have 10 months of organoid growth in normal patient and Alzheimer's patient growth. So we can see the formation of different structures in this organoid growth, okay? So now comes the interesting question. Why is it that so many different diseases show the same mechanism? And I'm gonna give you my perspective on this and how we are approaching this problem. So in my lab, we have worked at so many different diseases, diseases of the liver, diseases of the muscle, diseases of uh, vascular system. In all these cases, we went back and re-examined the results. In all these cases, what happens is that the, when you have a stress in a tissue or stress in a cell, the cell is reprogrammed or programmed to de-differentiate, to protect itself. Wound healing is an example of that. You cut yourself, the cell essentially goes into epithelial mesenchymal transition. Many of you know this, EMT. And the reason it goes into EMT is it protects itself and re-differentiates -de -re back into an epithelial skin cell, for example, or other cells, right? We know this from real experience. We found out this is to be true in the muscle, in the liver, in the vascular system. Anytime there's an injury or anytime there is a stress, whether it is a toxic stress, oxidative stress, or any type of stress, the cell and tissues reprogrammed so that it can go back into a protective state. It can build more fibrinogen and other proteins that form a moat around it. It can do inflammatory signals which says that the cell is under danger. Those are three hallmarks of every single chronic disease. It happens in the brain too, except that in the brain, when it happens, you lose synaptic connections. So you're no longer able to go back into restoring your normal cortical structure as a consequence, your brain gets impaired to a point that you don't have an ability to do this. So what's the next steps? So what we would like to do is to have an early marker or an early indicator, which is going to tell us that the cells are going to be reprogrammed. And if we can stop them, prevent them from being reprogrammed, then we have a chance of addressing dementia, addressing Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, or other brain disorders. This is a quest in my lab. How are we going about it? We are taking brain organoids from Alzheimer's patients. We are taking brain organoids from uh, Parkinson's patients, Huntington's patients. We want to figure out how to restore or prevent de-differentiation in these organoids from early stages. So we are monitoring them longitudinally across time, okay, going across time so that we can really understand how this happens. Now I'm going to finally tell you for the next three minutes or four minutes, I'm going to tell you a story which tells you how significant this is for other things. So let me walk you through that. So years ago when we were, I was really naive and stupid. And so I didn't really understand this concept. Now we understand this concept more clearly. At that time, we are talking about 10 years ago. We are doing research in collaboration with uh, Inder Verma, who's well known, who's in the Salk Institute. 
And we were working in this area called glioblastoma. I don't know how many of you know, glioblastoma is the cancer of the brain. It is a signature of death. When somebody gets a glioblastoma, it's not a matter of if they will survive. It's a question of whether it's days or weeks or months, a few months at the most. So Inder was working for a long time on glioblastoma, where he was looking at, uh, I mean, all these uh, different targets. He was interested in looking at uh, drug targets and so there. So he came to us at one point and said that, hey, you know, I'm really interested in looking at mouse models. We are going to induce glioma. We want to know whether this glioma that is induced in the mouse brain, is that, or those tissue and cells, what are they like? If you tell us what they are like, we can try to understand the biology of what is happening to these cells. So he said, okay, great, we'll take up this challenge. Now, this brought a very interesting engineering challenge, and I'll tell you about it in just a minute. So this is our goal. Our goal was to really take these stem cells, uh, take these neurons, and then figure out whether they are like stem cells or whether they are something else. So we are really trying to figure out. One problem that we had was when you induce glioma in the mouse brain, there are only a few cells. I mean, you don't have, uh, it's not like putting a cell culture, uh, in, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neuron where you have millions of cells you can deal with. Here you have thousands of cells. So we have so little mRNA that we can profile. We have little RNA we can profile. So we said, what is the solution around it? So I worked for, this was in 2012 or 13 or something. We worked very hard on trying to profile this. We went to Illumina, which is a big company in San Diego. So we told Illumina that, you know, hey, you know, we've got very little sample of this thing. Can you help us really profile this? They tried their best and we could only get, you know, 30%, 40% mapping. So I said, okay, what's the engineering solution to this? So I came up with this idea that, okay, here's what we are going to do. The reason why we were not able to get more than 30% mapping was because of thermodynamics. It's just simple. We use the primers. The whole idea is they use primers to amplify the RNA. We said you can use primers to amplify. They have only some X number of primers. And these primers go and bind to the most binding, obvious binding site. So they were amplifying only some nucleotides. They were not amplifying the entire mRNA. So we said, okay, can I, how many primers do I need? to cover the entire chromatin? That's a computational question, right? We said, how many primers do I need? So I said, okay, then I got somebody in my lab, a postdoc in my lab, Panko, said, why don't we go and find out how many primers do we need, minimum? And to our enormous surprise, we found that with 54 primers for human and mouse, we were able to cover the entire 99% of the transcriptome. So then we said, okay, let's design these primers. So we didn't, I mean, I'm, really not very sophisticated. So I said, let's design these primers. We designed the primers and for the next one year, everything failed. Why did it fail? So then we found out that because we were, these primers are small bits of nucleotides, they were falling off. They were not binding to the thing very well. So I said, okay, let's do the following. Let's do a low temperature prim primer design. Then we can do a high temperature design once we expand it. So this is called a design primer amplification strategy. Is a very bright student of mine, Vipul Bhargav. He worked for two years, his rear end off. At the end of the time, he was able to show that we were able to map 99% uh, in blue this. We have been able to map, and we are able to show comparison quantitatively R squared of 0.94. Look at the mapping. We are able to map everything, 99% of the transcriptome. Now, this is, of course, a popular technology. Everybody in the world is using this technology. But this is the design primer technology that we developed in 2014 or something like that. So, OK, then we showed validation of this technology. Now, I want to come back to the brain, glioblastoma. We applied it to the brain, and we said, these cells don't look like brain cells, the glioma cells. They look more like precursor cells. At that time, of course, I had no clue about de-differentiation and all these things. So I just simply published a paper where we said, okay, these cells look much more like pluripotent cells. But we did more than that. We said, okay, let's look at what is the common element between this. We showed that you know, the common things in the glioma were these three things, wind pathway, focal adhesion, and cell cycle. Now I can explain to you why this is the case, because cell cycle is upregulated, right? And, and uh, pluripotency is upregulated, and the cells come together forming clumps. Now I know it, which is so, uh, but then I didn't know it. So then, but however, we found a common gene, one gene, this SPP1 common between these things. We said, so I told Inder, let's knock this gene out in the mouse models and see if it removes cancer, okay? If it does, then we have a proof 
of this hypothesis. That's exactly what we did. We knocked this one gene out. First, we did it experiments with, uh, with just simply using a knockdown of this. You can see this is cancer, knockdown, cancer goes away. Okay? We did the same thing with antibodies. We just said, okay, let's just do it with antibodies. This is all, I mean, cancer. Look at the antibody thing, it reduces. Okay? What about drugs? We said, then we said, okay, this is in astrocytes and neurons. We did it in all kinds of cells. He said, okay, let's look at what happens to the lifetime of these, uh, of these things. We looked at all these pathways. They're restored back. Looked at the lifetime of these things. We looked also experiments in the mouse. This is experiments in the mouse brain where we show that the, the cancer goes away. I'm going to skip this slide. The lifetime of the mouse. Look at the lifetime of the mouse. The mouse now started living longer and longer and longer by this knockdown. Very simple. This is just a brutal treatment on the mice. We take the mice and knock out the gene it lives longer, okay? Now, in fact, uh, Inder is pursuing this where he's taking a small molecule drug target for glioblastoma. He is doing it as a clinical trial in India. He has a company in India, in Bangalore, and he's doing this in a clinical trial in Bangalore. Okay, so then what's the bottom line story? This is again the same story where we can show that this gene is really the gene that causes big death, and so just a story complete. So let's, let me tell you the last slide. So we, what we showed was, we said, here's an example of what happens in a stem cell going into a neuron astrocyte oligodendrocyte. In the case of Alzheimer's, you're going back into a precursor-like state. Glioblastoma, you're going to a precursor state. In the Alzheimer's case, and in the Huntington's case, Parkinson's case, the cells don't reproduce. The cell cycle is not complete. In the cancer, the cell cycle is complete. So what happens? So you start producing more and more cancer. It grows, it proliferates. And this is true in not just brain cancer, it is true in all cancer. So we now have a central thinking or hypothesis under chronic stress, cells de-differentiate. Most of the times they recover back their native tissue state when the stress is relieved. Sometimes they don't recover back when the stress goes beyond a certain point and they go into a cancer state. So we now have a kind of a hypothesis in terms of how to approach this problem. In Alzheimer's, we are going to approach this problem by doing targeted therapy, at first in the level of organoids, then we are going to try to do it in a clinical trial at some level, hopefully. And as one of my philanthropic friend, philanthropy friends uh, is very fond of saying, I was explaining to him this, how we are doing all this. He said, do something before you forget. So I want to stop with that. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, these are all the people involved. Thank you so much, Shankar, for the very fascinating and amazing talk. Um, so we have uh, some time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, Ashwin. Thank you, Subramaniam, for such a wonderful and enlightening talk, especially the system approach which you are utilizing. Uh, my question is, uh, is basically I was losing the track uh, due to the fact that you have not talked about the role of aggregates uh, in your, uh, you know, organoid culture and, and whether they are part of the toxicity or, or synaptic loss or not. So, uh, your thought on this, please. Thank you. It's a very, very good question. So, I want to divide your question into two parts. The first part is, when does the disease begin? And the second part is, is the plaque formation, once the plaques are formed, are they going to affect the brain? There are two distinct questions. Once the plaques build up to a certain stage, they are, there's a physical crowding effect. There's an effect of really taking over cells, and cells are really, there's biomechanics, there's fluidics, which means there's no oxygen to these cells, uh, they, so the cells are going to die and necrose, and this is how the death happens in Alzheimer's disease. But by the time we get to that point, can we look at, are they the origin? The answer now is very clear to the community. The origin of this is not the formation of aggregates. By the time aggregates are formed, we are already getting to a point where it's late. So the origin is much earlier. So our goal is to look at the origins. In the organoids, for example, brain organoids, 
we are starting to see the aggregation of these plaques. But in the 10-month time frame, we don't see the organoid dying yet. We do see diminution in the organoids and diminution in the neuronal synapse formation. But there's no, I mean, complete destruction of organoids. But maybe if you pursue it further, we are now only 10 months into building these organoids. We are going to extend up to, up to two years if we can, and then we'll see what happens to the organoids. So the answer to your question is, it's a chicken neck problem. I mean, once you form the chicken, it can have all kinds of problems that goes back to the issue, right? But the, our question is to catch it at the early stage to see what happens. Did I answer your question? Yeah. That's our cur current hypothesis. By the time aggregates, before that, there are many other processes initiated. So we want to prevent the initiation of these processes. Uh, Amitabha. Uh, Shankar, so uh, if uh, one takeaway message from your uh, presentation is that uh, one, cells are de-differentiating, two, the chromatin accessibility is changing. So two questions coupled, related. That is, uh, I was under the naive impression that uh, cells that are uh, more pluripotent they would have higher chromatin accessibility because they might go to different kinds of lineages. And two is that uh, if you took a look at uh, really uh, progenitor cells, do they have similar kind of uh, chromatin architecture in terms of accessibility and not having it? So they're both, uh, I mean, they're, you have a complex set of questions. They're all related and very, very good questions. So first conception that just proliferating cells have higher chromatin accessibility. They have higher chromatin accessibility for genes that are involved in cell cycle and proliferation. It doesn't mean that they have higher chromatin accessibility in all other regions. That's number one. I mean, we know this from a large number of differentiation phenomena. So the answer to the one part of the question is, yes, you know, there's increased chromatin accessibility for CDC, I mean, cell cycles, CD kinases, and so forth. However, the reduced, I didn't show you the cell cycle diagram clearly. So there's a reduced chromatin accessibility in, for example, neuronal specification and so forth. So it is not, a, it's not a, everything is open. It's a question of some things are open, some things are less open. If you take pluripotent stem cells, pluripotent stem cells are very interesting cells in the sense that they have the ability to form different germ layers. However, a lot of them are silenced unless they are induced to change in the direction. In our embryo, we have cues, extra embryonic cues, and these cues prime them to go from to an ectoderm, into a mesoderm, into an endoderm. Till then, they are silent. They are happy to be just silent, yet being effective. Right? This is exactly what happens here. We are going to, in fact, when you have wound healing, epithelial mesenchymal transition, mesenchymal cells are just that. They are able to preserve their ability to go back into epithelial cells, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have formation of any tissue, many tissues. So that's the answer to other answer to it. So when we look at chromatin accessibility, the reason why I brought chromatin, cell state, this is a concept of cell state. In fact, our current work in breast cancer with some extremely exciting results about how these cell states change even within epithelial cells. I don't have time to tell you this. Maybe next year, next time, when I come to IIT Kanpur, I'll tell you. But this is really the question of what is the cell state? Can we determine it through chromatin topology, which tells you how to regulate things? Right, that's where we are at, at the moment. Okay. Uh, actually, there are so many, I can see hands. So just two more questions. Uh, Okay, and then students and then. So I was just curious on your thoughts on what is the primary uh, event that you think is responsible for Alzheimer's disease? Like you talked about the neuron-centric um, mm. processes. What's the role of neuron glia crosstalk in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis? Yeah. I think you ate enough chocolates today. You are really high energy. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a super question. This is absolutely the question that I get asked in many, many places. So it's all beautiful, you know the mechanism, how it happens, you know how, what type of drugging you're going to do, but what causes it? Very good question, so beautiful question. 
So in the case of familial Alzheimer's disease, we know the cause because it's a mutation in presenlin 1, presenlin 2, which are part of this enzyme complex, gamma secretase complex, which is the one that's responsible. So beautiful, clear story. What about in non, in Alzheimer's, in the, I mean, old patients who don't have these mutations? Our current hypothesis is stress is causing it. What is stress? It can be toxic stress. It can be oxidative stress. It can be, for example, there's not enough oxygen supply in that region of the brain because of the fact you have injury, brain injury, traumatic brain injury. In fact, we, I didn't tell you the story. We have, we're now looking at traumatic brain injury, same phenomena. So you have essentially occlusion, no oxygen to these regions of the brain. That's stress. So we think stress in other tissues in human body, stress is the main cause. In fact, to do this thing, we published a very nice paper which showed that in endothelial cells, we stress the endothelial cell to see at what point the cell decides to die at what point the cell recovers back into death. It's called, we call this as a, the nexus between life and death in a cell, right? So this is exactly what we think happens. We think we have a kind of a transition point at which point this tells the cell, hey, you know, this is so much stress you cannot survive. Commit suicide, right? Otherwise it says, okay, this is, we can recover from the stress. It recovers. So we looked at the suspension point between life and death in a cell. So we think stress is the cause. What stress, how do we originate? I don't know the answer to that. I can't, it's very complex, so we don't know the answer to that. Can I quick question? Yes. I think you should give it to Dhirendra. He has another question too yeah, after. Yeah. after. Uh, Shankar, uh, really nice uh, talk. I enjoyed it. Wanted to ask you two things. One was, uh, in the Eli Lilly trial, uh, there was one statement at the end of the abstract which said that although it got rid of the plaques, but it made them prone to other diseases, including cancer. I don't know if your group was interested in looking at that aspect, but I, if you can throw some light on that. So the reason I brought the cancer in the last part of my talk was exactly to address your question. So the reason why uh, the Lilly drug it did not completely address the cell cycle. It did not completely address the, the synaptic form, formation. So the first part of it is, even though it removed the plaques, it did not do that. Because it did not restore the cell back into a neuron, it's now a pluripotent cell. So what can it do? It starts reproducing. Right. When it starts reproducing, mm -hmm. it is cancer. Uh, the, the other thing was just the l last uh, slide during your conclusion. Uh, you said that uh, your hypothesis now is that this is dedifferentiating into a slightly more uh, progenitor type cell. Correct. Uh, do you have a hold on the mechanisms that lead to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In and fact, yeah. just wanted to complete that. And yeah. if you do, then you, you probably can also lead to, instead of therapy, you can also look at prevention because Preventive action can be taken for disallowing that progression towards. Yeah. So clearly, cell state change is the route which it takes. What does it mean? It means that the chromatin is going into a non-neuronal, non-specific cell state. Whether it is endothelial cell or neuron or whatever disease, it's going back into a precursor cell. How is it going doing it? It's doing it through chromatin landscape changes. Now, but what is the cost? This is the question that uh, she asked. The cost is that stress. So if we can alleviate that stress at some level, then we can probably restore. I don't know what the cause of the stress is in the brain. But in other cases, we know the causes of these things. For example, in liver disease, we looked at it in liver disease, going from non-alcoholic, from NAFLD, fatty liver disease, into steatohepatitis. We know that there is a well-defined set of factors that are controlling this. Diet, for example, alcohol, for example, or other things. So if you can alleviate these factors, can we reverse it back? And this is other people are trying this now in going from NASH to NAFLD uh, into reducing their state. So the answer to your question is yes. You know, We know the type of mechanism cell state change overall. Can we address it in some way? Now, there's a second way of thinking about it, and this is what we are really thinking about. When you are going to now go back into a pre, I mean, stay pre, I mean, uh, what do you call, precursor-like precursor state. If I can induce, have a factor which can keep it in the neuronal state or keep inducing it to go into a neuron, 
then it's a good strategy. In fact, one of the drugs I talked about, I didn't have a chance to go into detail, is exactly that, which tries to differentiate a stem cell into a neuron. And so this is what we're trying to do to look at whether we can keep it in the neuronal state. And an experiment I didn't tell all of you about, in which we're doing in collaboration with Cambridge, we're actually taking a normal stem cell and growing it into a neuron, monitoring it through the entire process of you know, 70 different time points. So we can look at exactly how to trigger, at what stage can you trigger with what factor the conversion to the next stage. And we are trying all those kinds of experiments now in organoids. Are quick question? Yep. Yeah. So you have enormous amount of data. So how did you integrate all those things and uh, to narrow down uh, potential drugs? And how these drugs are working? Like, uh, does it remove the plaques as well as uh, changes the cell fate? And my second question would be like, uh, how does methylation changes the expression pattern uh, in case of uh, a disease condition? And uh, apart from the familial uh, uh, mutations, does any dry other somatic driver mutations also contribute to this disease? Okay, I mean, there are three questions and I'll answer each of them. And if I forget, you can remind me. So, I mean, the first question deals with the fact that, uh, I mean, how do, we, how, how do we reduce all this complex data into actionable consequences? I yesterday pointed out the fact that all this data essentially boils down to, in order to convert them into knowledge, we have to think about models at multiple levels of hierarchy. In my lab, I'm driven by the fact, I don't think that I can put everything into a machine and out comes some great result. And that's, in my opinion, a pipe dream. So we go after we use the fact that we have knowledge of mechanisms, knowledge of, uh, I mean, various types of phenotypes, knowledge of pathways, knowledge of, so we induce all of those in combination with the data to project them into concrete mechanisms. So data reduction is not just simply, a, uh, you just feed everything into a machine. Data reduction is guided by knowledge-driven approaches. This is the approach we've taken since uh, for the past 30 years in my career. I've just simply followed this logic and it's worked very well. That's the first answer to your question. Now, the answer to your question with reference to how do you get all these, uh, I mean, drugs to really influence or impact these things. So our goal is not to have target a drug at a single protein or a single gene, but we want to target it at a whole mechanism, which means the more downstream you target a mechanism, the better off you are because you have less off target effects. So our targets are always going to be mechanism driven where you're going as down the pathway as possible so that you're really not affecting anything else that was happening earlier. And what is your third question? It's a very interesting question. Uh, third was like, uh, how does uh, like uh, any driver mutations? Oh yes, very good question. You asked me methylation and driver mutations, okay. We looked at DNA methylation and there is there are some changes, but there is no, it is not as dramatic and D I'm talking about not chromatin modification, I'm talking about DNA methylation. It's not so dramatic at the moment in our hands. So we don't think that that's a long-term, that's really, it is a really long-term concept, epigenetic change, and we're not, we don't see that's a factor. Now, somatic mutations are a different story, which means that what he's talking about as somatic mutations is mutations that happen in the lifetime of the disease in the, in the chromatin. There are somatic mutations, there's no question about it, and people are starting to map genome-wide association studies. However, there are, we don't know in late onset Alzheimer's disease, we don't see somatic mutations in the presenilin-1, presenilin-2 APP genes. We don't see that. Maybe there are other genes. I mean, it's a whole background, it's a sea of things. We don't know. So we don't have the answer because we don't have the genome sequence, somatic mutation map, somatic map, of all the Alzheimer's patients. When we start getting it, we can do genome-wide association studies. So the jury is out. So the very last question. So thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I learned a lot. So my question is actually a simple one. In familial AD caused by mutation in uh, PSEN1, if I use gene editing to correct mutation, let's say in your iPSC-derived neurons, can we reverse the disease phenotype? You must have reviewed our paper or something because one of our reviewers has asked the same question, <laughs> whether, whether you make the reverse change, I mean, you alter the genotype back and see if you're reversing the mutation. So those experiments are underway. Part of the problem in doing that 
is it turns out that when you do a CRISPR-Cas9-like experiment to do CRISPR-I to change this back into a native mutation, it's toxic to the cells. So we are not able to really sustain that for a long time. So we convinced the reviewer, hey, you know, it's a good idea, but that's not the question we are really asking. We are really asking the question of comparative mechanisms, but however, we are going to do it. So I just uh, received an NIH grant, I mean, excellent score. We don't have the grant yet. We've got a score of five percentile, which is going to, we are proposed doing exactly that. We want to get isogenic mutations and see if it can restore the disease. So thank you for the good question. So it's, you must have reviewed something. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sure you know many of you have questions. We have a you know, tea break after this session. Please feel free to talk to Shankar. Thanks so much, Shankar, for the very exciting talk. And uh, please join me in thanking you. <laughs> so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Priyanka Bhagati. Dr. Priyanka Bagde is a professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at IIT Kanpur. Before that, she worked as a software architect in Intel Corporation, US, for five years. She did her PhD in Computer Science from Arizona State University. Her current research focuses on the Internet of Things, Deep Learning, and Cyber Physical System. Dr. Bagde's IoT Vision Lab believes that the future is connected and that the power of IoT lies in its ability to create intelligent systems that can communicate with each other, learn from each other, and adapt to changing circumstances. By combining IoT with computer vision, they aim to connect systems that can not only collect and process data, but also make sense of it in real time. Thank you, Bhagavad. Thank you, Professor Shankar, for the warm introduction. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about various use cases of IoT in healthcare. So, you will get snapshots of different use cases. So, if you have, if you want to know more details, you can ask me questions. But there are so many things. So, I thought that I will just uh, show some snapshots. Okay. So before we get started with the IoT use cases or the IoT applications in hardware, first of all, let's try to understand what is IoT. So IoT is basically Internet of Things. And uh, here's the definition that I use in my class as well. So IoT or the Internet of Things are basically small ubiquitous devices which are connected to the internet and these devices keep on collecting information from the environment. So IoT is not only for the healthcare but it is also for other applications. So for example, uh, you can think about uh, smart traffic management or smart building management. So anywhere, wherever we want to understand something from our environment, we want to learn the context of the environment, there comes the IoT. Okay. Uh, and as it says that it uses small devices. So since these devices are small, you can think about what are the challenges these devices or the systems can face. The first challenge is less power, less memory, less computation power. Okay, so whatever data we collect, we have to ensure that we should be able to process that data or try to understand the context of the environment with minimal computations, okay? So, apart from the temperature sensor, ECG sensor, blood pressure monitoring, here I just enlisted three very smart sensors which are being used widely nowadays. So, the first uh, IoT sensor or the IoT device is smart banded. Okay, this was invented by University of Glasgow in uh, 2021. And this particular banded, it 
uh, incorporates temperature sensor, pressure sensor, it measures the screen, uh, skin strain level and based on that they try to figure out how much the wound uh, underneath the skin has been healed. So patient doesn't need to go to the doctor or the hospital all the time. This sensor directly sends data over Wi-Fi to doctor's smartphone or the computer system and doctors are able to monitor the patients remotely. Okay, so that even doctors don't need to invest the time. They can simply look at the graph. Okay, this is how the patient is doing, whether the patient needs to, uh, if there is a need to change the treatment, whether there is a need to uh, redo the band-aid or any other thing or change in medications, everything can be decided remotely. Uh, the next sensor or the IoT device is ECG patch. So we know that there are lots of heart patients or cardiovascular diseases are increasing with uh, our newer lifestyle. So uh, doctors uh, and the researchers, they came up with this ECG patch, which patients or even normal people can wear all the time. And this patch basically captures the respiratory uh, rate as well as ECG. This is basically three lead ECG. It captures that data and send that to the remote doctor all the time. And then again, remote doctors keep on observing the data. Actually, doctors don't look at the ECGs directly. They look at the analyzed data. They just check the pattern, how the ECG is changing, how the PQRS waveforms are changing over the period. Okay. The third one is glucose meter. So uh, you might have heard about continuous glucose monitoring, CGM. It is the new acronym now, nowadays. So uh, even most of the uh, normal patients, they, they are diabetic patients. Uh, in day-to-day -day life, they just wear this on their arm to monitor their blood glucose level continuously. So instead of pricking the finger every morning to check your blood glucose level, this basically keeps on checking your blood glucose level, send the data to your smartphone so that even you can look into how your blood glucose level is changing throughout the day. And this also, uh, this information also gets sent to the doctor and then again doctor is, uh, can look at all these things remotely. So basically with IoT and these health sensors, we can enable patients and doctors to have continuous monitoring and as well as remote inspection of patient's health. Okay. So apart from these sensors, Camera is also considered as an important IoT sensor because how do we define a sensor? That the sen sensor or the device which can understand the context of the environment. And camera is doing the same thing. It is trying to understand the context of the environment with visual aspects. Okay. Uh, so uh, in this throughout the presentation, we won't. Uh, we, we not only will consider the sensors which are looking at the physiological data, but we will consider camera as an IoT sensor as well. Uh, so this is a very typical use case of healthcare that there is a patient who is wearing different variable IoT devices. These sensors are responsible for collecting physiological data of that patient or even the person. So all of us, we know that we use those smart watches or smart bands, right? which keep on tracking our uh, respiratory rate, then it tracks our temperature, number of steps we have uh, taken that day and based on that it calculates how much, how many calories you burn throughout the day. Okay, so even that smart watch or smart band is considered as an IoT device. So we collect all this data and then that data gets sent to your smartphone so that you can even take a look at your smartphone app and check that okay how you are doing throughout the day so even this iot sensors uh, are applicable for uh, our day-to-day -day life monitoring as well then smartphones don't have enough memory to store all this data so eventually probably uh, Nowadays, these smart watches, they follow a strategy of sending data weekly, usually every Sunday night to the cloud. And all this data is stored on the cloud so that 
we can use different data analysis algorithm to do historical analysis of that patient's behavior or the health conditions throughout many years okay so that data goes to the data center and doctors are also connected to the data center so remote doctors can also keep on observing these things so for normal life right when you are just measuring like uh, how many steps you are taking throughout the day lo doctors looking at your data won't matter that much but if you have a critical condition in that case this con direct connection with the doctor is very helpful uh, and then in the end there is a hospital data center as well so patients in the hospital as well they can be on these variable devices and based on the conditions of the patients hospitals can actually decide that what kind of drugs are required in this particular areas of the hospital that's why in the end i call that as a business layer because these sensor data they also help hospitals to decide what kind of drugs what kind of uh, diseases are, diseases are going in particular area so uh, during second covid wave in india actually we did analysis with the up government where we figured out that what are the hot spots for covid uh, around kanpur cities uh, and then we gave feedback to the up government and accordingly up government actually provided medical drugs in those particular area and for that we took all the data from the abha workers who went to every village to every person to collect the data so that was one of the experiment where I, I really understood the business part of the IoT system. Okay. Uh, so we'll look at one very classic example of the continuous monitoring. So that is IoT enabled teleambulance. So nowadays, like whenever patients are in the ambulance, you can uh, see that those patients, they wear ECGs or they wear basic uh, something similar to ventilator like oxygen uh, supply the uh, their temperature gets measured their bp gets measured but everything gets just measured and everything stays inside the ambulance okay so during the transit we are not treating that patient or whatever treatment is provided that is provided only at the nurse level because we cannot have md doctor in every ambulance okay so we are basically wasting that much time for that patient's treatment. So uh, usually when ambulances are used, whenever there is a heart attack or some brain related surgery or any maternity related or uh, any accident, right? So all these cases are very serious cases which require immediate intervention from the medical professionals. But nowadays, like, uh, we cannot provide that. So the proposed system is teleambulance. Uh, so all those, uh, uh, limitations of the current healthcare system I have just mentioned so what if we have all the uh, sensors which are used on patients body inside the ambulance are connected to the internet and what if we keep on sending this data to the remote doctor sitting in some hospital so doctors can immediately start the treatment on that patient during that transit so that we won't even waste that time okay and for that one now uh, with the increased use of 5g or 5g tower installations we can send this data quickly to the remote doctors and during that time even doctors can assess the physiological condition of that patient and decide that which hospital that patient can go to okay so during covid there were multiple hospitals but the ventilators were not available so Ambulance were, ambulances were taking these patients to different hospitals and then the hospitals used to tell that okay we don't have any ventilator available but what if if all the hospitals were connected and we had a database okay these hospitals have the ventilators available we could have sent those patients to those particular hospitals directly instead of wasting time in going from one hospital to the other hospital okay so this is the completely connected emergency healthcare system that can be enabled with uh, iot devices and i'm working with uh, up government and tata communications to enable this system uh, i recently got uh, uh, funding for 5G lab from Indian government to enable this system. So hopefully this should be in picture very soon. Uh, okay. 
So one thing is patient routing that I said that, okay, depending on the patient's condition, we can find the nearest hospital as well as, first of all, nearest ambulance to pick up the patient, then nearest hospital. Uh, remote patient monitoring, then again, that IoT devices, they keep on collecting the data, send that data to the doctor. One interesting aspect in uh, sending the data to the doctor is, here the assumption is we have continuous internet connectivity however our vehicle is mobile vehicle is not stopped it's not stationary in india when you go from one place to other place there is no guarantee that you will continuously have communication signal available okay even if i am saying that i got funding for 5g but i know that 5g is not available i'm not sure whether 5g even available here right now here or not i haven't checked my phone but there are not that many 5g towers uh, deployed yet okay so when we are sending this data what if the communication channel changes so what if we went from we go from 5g to 4g to gsm to no signal at all can we still work with teleambulance Okay, so for that one, we developed a machine learning model which can predict the next ECG pick. Uh, so we are successful in predicting up to next PCG, uh, ECG picks for uh, next five minutes. After that, it's very difficult because if the patient is having heart attack, their ECG changes quite drastically. And if we don't know the patient's ECG beforehand, that means if we don't have the digital twin of the heart of that patient, then it, this is very difficult. So that's why we are yet uh, we are only successful up to calculating ECG picks for next five minutes. And we thought that, okay, that is sufficient. Another technique that we have developed that uh, can we send a very compressed data? So if we don't have 5G connection, if we have GSM connection, instead of sending a complete ECG, can we only send particular picks and regenerate that ECG at the doctor's end? And we are completely successful in that. And we are uh, right now uh, testing this in Narayana Hospital, Bangalore. So they, uh, it's a uh, cardiology hospital and they are testing the model to ensure that this actually works. Uh, and we are also working uh, uh, with them to uh, quickly detect the ventricular arrhythmia so that that data can be used uh, during the heart surgery. So we are working on separating P waves and T waves for particularly for the VT patients where these P waves and T waves are not visible in ECGs. So can we extract those using some computational uh, analogies? Because even doctors are not able to see it, but they still want to know the frequency. So it's not visually uh, there, but in com computationally it's available. So we are working on uh, segregating P waves uh, and T waves from the rest of the ECG. Okay. Another thing is we want everything to happen in real time. So again, less computation. How can we achieve the best in less computation with less computational power available as well? So we cannot assume that we are doing everything on GPUs. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Shankar just gave an awesome talk on the Alzheimer's and the Parkinson's disease. So basically he looked into the brain, brain cells and uh, how the drugs can perform. My work mo focuses more on how we can help these patients in their day-to-day -day life, okay? So, uh, in elderly care monitoring, basically, uh, I'm looking at the Parkinson's disease patients. I'm collaborating with the SGPJ hospital, still waiting for the data, but I developed some uh, initial thought process on this. So, for the Parkinson's patients, over the period, their gait changes. So, gait means their walking style, okay? And nowadays, like it is all over the world, this gait is measured by the subject expert. So if you go from one hospital to the other hospital, your analysis might change because it is very subjective, right? And if the same doctor doesn't look at you or doesn't assess your condition for your consecutive visits, that means it can also lead to the errors. So how can we avoid this gait measurement errors and help these patients 
to uh, get better treatment so for that i propose that okay we can use uh, our smartphones in smartphone we have gyroscope and accelerometer that can measure the way uh, our gait as well as we can use cameras in the hospital setup and keep on recording all the visits of these patients and use computer vision algorithm to find the minute changes in the gait which the subject expert might not be able to find of course all these algorithms will be trained with the help of the subject expert as well because since i am not the medical i am not a medical professional i can, for me all this data is just numbers but what are the features that i should look at doctors definitely help uh, in all the respects so even for the ecg extraction right for me it is just a waveform means i i uh, i am not being uh, i am still human i am not looking at these things as robot but when i look, start working on a computer for me all these just are numbers and i am just trying to extract some waveforms from it and then doctors decide how to use that data further uh another thing is person tracking and detection so for the alzheimer's patient as dr shankar already mentioned that they tend to lose their memory so can we track these people when they are in the elderly care uh, setup or when they are at home so that we can guide them because most of the times these patients are old they are staying alone at home so how can we keep track of these patients throughout so basically we have developed a computer vision algorithm where even though there is no overlapping area between two cameras right so for example we can have camera in the living room we can have camera outside uh, the home but we cannot have camera in the rest rooms or even in the bedroom right so uh, can we still detect that person even if that person goes from one area to another area with different clothes so we proved that okay it is possible using computer vision algorithms and another thing that we are working on what if we have non vision sensor in one room that means motion sensor and we have com uh, camera in another room can we still detect the same person walked from one room to the other room okay okay uh, so the another important aspect in security uh, in iot devices is security so i showed you the continuous glucose monitor <laughs> so this might be a shock for all of you but none of the currently available continuous glucose monitors use any of the security protocol they simply measure your glucose level and they send the glucose level the value as it is in plain text to your smartphone through bluetooth channel so any attacker or hacker can actually modify that value right away even i can do it right away within 2 minutes and then your smartphone will start showcasing random values your doctors will give you, start giving you some random medications because doctors just have that data okay so it is it is scary so that's why it's very important for us to look at the security as well uh yes <laughs> uh another thing is uh, as uh, i just alerted all of you regarding how hackers can play with your health data so digital forensics of medical devices is very important currently i am collaborating with ge healthcare which uh, which develops different medical devices so they are getting different legal cases on their company for uh these hackers basically attack their medical devices and uh, patients are saying that the patient patient's family is saying that patients did not die because of the physiological changes that happened in the patient but the patient died because of the cyber attack and that attack has actually changed some of the parameters on the medical device so for example ventilator ventilator is responsible for providing a certain amount of oxygen to patient's lungs but what if the ventilator get gets attacked then the oxygen input oxygen level will change it might go to zero or or it might be too large to be handled by that patient's lungs then the patient will die right and these are true cases so i am working with ge healthcare to analyze that okay how these attacks happen can we detect these attacks uh uh when there is remote communication happening with these medical devices because all these devices are connected to the internet because that's how doctors can monitor them remotely uh 
so for all ICU patients can we monitor all the data traffic going through these devices uh, another thing is whenever doctors actually look at the DICOM images the CT scan images MRI images the DICOM has a feature that it has the empty space uh, in the image uh, which allows doctors to open that image on their smartphone on their tablet on their Linux system on their Mac on their Windows system but this feature also has a drawback because it allows these different formats of the image it has lots of empty space so that's where the attacker puts the malware as soon as the doctor opens the image it inserts the malware into doctor's system and it just changes the image so then doctors start taking wrong decisions or might take wrong decisions so i'm helping g healthcare to look at all these uh, attacks and also look at how to retrieve their medical device from these attacks because these devices they are very expensive and once the malware goes into any medical device or for that matter any device it it's very difficult to get rid of that malware you have basically need to scrap that system completely but we cannot afford to scrap medical devices okay so when we are working on how to uh, look at these uh, malware how do they work then generate the evidence for the codes to show that okay these are the affected areas of the medical device and how this is how we have retrieved the system back okay. uh, i already talked about the uh, intrusion detection so we are using machine learning algorithm to uh, basically uh, analyze all the data traffic again uh, also analyze the memory uh, of these computer systems to ensure that okay uh, when this malware process ran on that particular device what are the changes that happened on that uh, system's memory and what was the memory before the attack happened and what was the memory content after the attack has happened another issue that we are actually facing here all these devices they have very small memory so even if we decide to keep on storing the snapshots of the memory every after every one second right it's not possible so we have to smartly decide when to take that snapshot so for that we are developing another machine learning algorithm so this is basically a nest of machine learning algorithms to do different tasks uh, so smart hospitals where everything is connected another uh, interesting topic is remote surgery so uh, we know that okay lots of medical schools are there new doctors are coming up but when you actually visit the hospitals you realize that yes two minutes okay i will finish very quickly so you realize that okay there are uh, experts who are about to retire and new doctors are still learning from these experts okay so some of the decisions these experts take within a second means i have seen that in sgpj hospital in lucknow but the new doctors i don't, I don't want to scare any of you but they take around six to seven hours so we are looking into how this proce uh, process can be accelerated so we are looking into medical image analysis as well so in remote surgery these doctors can actually advise their uh, colleagues who are new into surgeries remotely as well irrespective of whether where they are sitting so we can have cameras installed in uh, operation theaters OTs and remote doctors can keep on looking at what are the things that are happening uh, and then we can use robots as well and uh, so robots uh, contain different IoT sensors so that the remote doctors can keep on looking at the robots another thing is in uh, during this is the last point that i will cover so during surgeries around 300 to 600 small different tools get used even for the small surgeries about 10 percent of the surgery implications that happen uh, in that one 10 percent are related to that some of the tools they still remain in person person's body so uh, i'm working with sgpj hospital to detect keep track of all these tools that are getting used in the surgeries uh, so that we get to know that whether any tool remained in patient's body so that is i think that's it this is basically using drones to collect uh, pathology samples from different places uh, in villages or in remote areas and send that to the pathology labs so that the testing can be done and then uh, again remote patient treatment that can happen easily so 
Okay, that's, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhadi, for providing a future of healthcare, uh, you know, a glimpse of uh, healthcare industry. Uh, you have, there, there are a few questions, Shankar, first. Dr. Dr. Bhadi, thank you so much. It's amazing, and it's really very, very important work. So my question to you is the following. Both in the case of uh, where you have failure of internet, 5G, 4G, FX, as well as in terms of security uh, information, the current thinking in US is that longitudinal measurements and modeling of longitudinal data can be used as an input feature for detecting, for example, errors for detecting, I mean, uh, intrusions. Because just like Fourier averaging, you don't average over all those things in an intrusion. So are your approaches with GE, for example, are they using longitudinal data? And the follow-up question to that is, AI ML is not very good at dealing with longitudinal measurements because they treat time as under lump parameter. So have you developed, are you developing methods to look at time as a unique dimension in terms of learning algorithms to bring feature evolution across time as a factor? Are you working on those things? Just curious to know. That's a very good question. Uh, so we are looking at the time-based data right now because the attacks that happen on the medical devices, the attack doesn't happen right away. It's a slow modification in the data. So even attackers are actually very smart. They don't want you to let the patient or any intrusion detection system know that the changes are happening. So for example, if your blood glucose level is right now, suppose 120. This is just an example, okay? It won't suddenly go to 260. It will go to 121. Slowly, day by day, they may keep on making changes so that you have to continuously observe how the changes are happening. And you have to continuously predict that, okay, if the person is having this kind of food and based on the history, whether this should be the next glucose level or not. So you do prediction and you do detection. So these two algorithms, they run in parallel. And you keep on checking and do cross verification. So this is for the glucose monitor. But the medical devices that I am working with GE, basically we are looking at the memory footprint right now. Because that is the most troublesome area and there are no tools available and nobody in the research, according to them, uh, like no researcher actually works in that area because it's very difficult. So we are trying to explore that at every second, how the memory is changing. And since we can't store it, we are training the models. And we are also storing certain, instead of just storing the models, but we are also storing some memory parameters somewhere. So basically we are right now, do, we are doing it in uh, one of the local system because G doesn't want to send anything to cloud. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Y yes, we are not considering right now because they are mainly, they want me to look at the time series data only, but that's a very good uh, thing that I, I will talk to them. I think there was somebody who raised hand. Yeah, please go ahead. Priyanka, you gave a wonderful talk and it was very interesting to see the things you're doing. So my question is the ambulance you were showing and you were showing that it, it has a number 108 and it has the connectivity to the professional. But the real scenario in India, especially in UP, like there is one ratio 22,000. Like a patient-doctor ratio is so high. Even patients who go to hospitals, they are not attended by the doctors when they are actually should be attended in their critical time. So is there anything uh, in your ambulance which can help uh, the professional which is there with them to get some primary treatment till they are connected to the uh, professional? Yes, so, uh, in ambulances, nurses are there. So even though they are not experts, they can provide the initial treatment 
and the model that i am talking about for tele ambulance there will be doctors sitting who won't be directly treating the patients means they won't be connected to the hospital means they won't be waiting for the patient and start treating the patient these doctors will be there only for remotely monitoring the patients so patient will keep on getting the treatment during the transit so once that patient reaches the hospital and start getting the treatment in the hospital then this remote doctor will get disconnected from that and he will he or she will start uh, communicating with other doctors so, so there yeah. will be a different set of doctors yeah. uh, especially for these ambulances yes. okay thank you Jibera Hospital is basically uh, for uh, creating MD doctors, right? So they uh, train MD doctors. It's a medical school, right? So in their three hours of education, there every day they have to sit in front of these remote systems for six hours. It's mandatory for them, and they remotely treat, <coughs> remotely treat the patients from villages. So okay. these patients come to the kiosk where these cameras and different health sensors are installed. So the nurses which are there in those villages, they take all the data from these patients, and then these remote doctors they look at the pa uh, patients through video conferencing. Okay. And there are around the two hundred such kiosks installed at least in UP that I know because I visit SGPJ quite often. So I have seen that these doctors they have to do this duty every six or six hours a day. It's compulsory for them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor Katti, very interesting talk. Uh, I just wanted to know. So many of the uh, things that you mentioned, they talk about taking data from one location to another location. Now, outside uh, any hacking or malware, what are the parameters that determine the quality of the data, because treatment is based on quality, so that the quality of the data that is transported is very high quality. That means at the source and at the end where it is received. How do you? What are the parameters that can affect the quality of the data? Yes. So uh, we can look at these from the two points. First is just the data where numbers are there. So or and the another thing is medical images. So when we look at just the data rate, right? so ECG, ECG even though it's an image, but it, it is actually a combination of PQRST waveform. We can send ECG as the image. If we can send that image as it is in 4K format, then doctors will receive that in the 4K format and they will be able to see. If we have 5G connection available, we can do that very easily and it can happen in real time. Okay, but what if we don't have that connectivity? right then we are only detecting the pqrst peaks and then we are redrawing that at the doctor's end so that might not be accurate because pqrst uh, do i have that wave have good connectivity we are only sending this threshold values that means we are only sending numbers we are not sending the complete range then we are regenerating that at the doctor's end using some uh, model thank you then we are generating that at the doctor's end with some model but there can be some waveform disruption here and that might lead to some new information okay so that we, in that case, we can say that we are not sending good quality data because we don't have good connectivity. If we send the complete data, then that's a different case. Same thing happened with medical images. So whether they are X-ray images or CT scan images, if you reduce the resolution rate, so it is imagine that when you had those small phones where, whose camera was not good and the current phones where, where we can take very good pictures, that's the difference in quality. And then based on what kind of quality data or what is the quality that the doctors are receiving in the end, their treatment or diagnosis might change. So that's why for ventricular tachycardia, we are trying to separate these waves. So instead of sending, if the connectivity is not good, if we can just take the T waves out and send those T waves to the medical professionals, instead of sending all the PQRST waveform, then that will help the doctors to take better decisions. 
So uh, the question I ha also yeah. had was that does it only depend on connectivity, the quality of the data at the recipient's end or does it depend on anything else? Yes. So uh, connectivity is one part. Another thing is the sensor resolutions as well. Again, the camera, right? What is the resolution for that camera? That is one thing. Even in the ECG, if you have those 12 lead ECGs, right? You get excellent ECG out. But the patches... That is not, that doesn't provide you good ECG out. So it also depends on what kind of sensors you are using. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Bagadi. I hope some of these things will be realized as part of the MFC. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Please join me in thanking So now we have lightning talk by students. The first uh, student speaker is uh, Ajita Shri. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ajita. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Hamim Zafar's lab, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Today, I'll be giving talk on SE Remo for Atlas level integration of single cell data set using deep generative model paired with adversarial classifier. This is a joint work with another PhD student, Krishna Pawan. So I'll start by giving a brief overview of single cell data. So it is through single cell sequencing technique that we are able to measure the gene expression at a cellular level in any given tissue. And hence, we are able to resolve the heterogeneity in any complex system. So single cell data looks like um, cells cross gene, where each entry defines the expression of that gene in that cell. But there are many challenges in single cell data because it's available from heterogeneous sources, sometimes from multiple labs, sometimes from different sequencing protocols, different donors and tissue samples, because of which there is presence of batch effects if we visually see the data. Here we can see in the diagram that the cell types are, so for example, cell type macrophages is spread across the whole plane because it is contributed from different batches. And integration is necessary so that we can have a nice representation as we can see in the middle diagram where similar cell types have come together in a cluster and the corresponding batches have been mixed. It's a primary and fundamental step because after integration we can do any downstream analysis. So we present our method SE Dreamer, a framework using which we can do a lot of different kinds of integration. It's a deep generative model that, has adver that do adversarial training. And it has multiple components using which we can do unsupervised integration where we do not use any cell label information. When we are utilizing cell type annotation in the data, then we do supervised, um, uh, we do supervised integration and semi-supervised integration. There are two goals of integration. First is bioconservation. And the second goal is of batch correction. As explained in the last panel. So we have demonstrated the performance of our method on a variety of challenges. First is the lung data, immune data, heart cell data, cross-species in integration, that is human and mouse integration, pancreas data, and uh, monkey retina data. I will be briefly explaining human mouse uh, results. So on the left hand side, we can see the unintegrated data. And on the right is the output of SE Dreamer where we see the batches have been integrated well. And in the last panel, we quantitatively see how the method is performing better compared to state-of-the-art method in terms of bioconservation. Second plot says about batch correction. And the last plot talks about the combined composite score, taking into account the holistic performance in both of these metrics. So here we are seeing 
so we did the study to see how well our method is able to uh, find some biological insights in the data so we uh, observed dendritic cell population we found um, some study um, by Villani et al., where we found out that dendritic cell population has multiple subcell types, DC1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we did this analysis in, uh, in our method. We did the subclustering and found out that our method is able to capture these subcell types pretty well. Whereas the second method, second best method called SCVI, um, these subpopulations were mixing with different cell types, and which is not ideal. We did a further comparison with another best performing method called Harmony, and here we observed that it is not able to find out DC1, DC5, and some subcell types well. Lastly, here I present a million cell data set called Healthy Heart. It has 0.5 million cells and large number of batches, 127. And here also we see that our method is able to integrate the data very well, as we can see on the left. And on the right, uh, it's the qualitative co quantitative comparison in both unsupervised and supervised category. SCDreamer is performing the best. Lastly, we manually removed some of the cell annotations from the data, 20% uh, cell label, missing cell label and 50% to see if the performance is remaining best uh, in that category or not. And we see that other methods performance have dropped while SCDreamer is able to maintain that good performance. In conclusion, I would like to say that SE Dreamer is a framework which, which is very scalable with, um, with respect to number of cells, batches, and it can do a variety of different integration tasks. And it is outperforming other methods by a large margin. And the link for the bioarchive and tutorial is available here. In acknowledgement, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Hameem Zafar, um, IIT Kanpur, Department of Computer Science, Mehta Family Center of Medicine for giving the opportunity, and Cosmic Lab members. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ajita Sri. Uh, I mean, if there is one question, I will allow, but we are running. Okay. So the next speaker is uh, Aditi Ladda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I will be presenting part of my uh, PhD work stating as sweet transporter and cadal receptor evolutionary and functional studies of the sequentially diverse pro membrane protein with the similar structure fold. So, as we know, in a eukaryotic cell, there are many processes which are important. Two of these processes are protein trafficking and sugar transportation in plant. So, in case of pro protein trafficking, as we know, as we know that after the synthesis of protein, they will get transported for, to the Golgi apparatus for their uh, modification. But in order to do so, some of the ER resident proteins, which helpful in the protein proper folding, also get transported from ER to the Golgi apparatus. So in order to bring them back, there is a receptor known as cadal receptor help to recognize the C-terminus of the ER resident protein and bring them back from the Golgi apparatus to the ER membrane. So, and uh, one of the other process in plants is the transportation of water and mineral from the roots to the shoot and other is the transportation of sugar from the leaves to the all the other part of the plant. So, one of the protein which is important in the transportation of sugar is the sweet transporter. So, these transporter help in the efflux of the sugar molecule from the parenchyma cell to the apoplastic space and then after the they will be uptaken by other transport other transporter to transport uh, in the whole plant so uh, in order to know more about these protein uh, researchers have crystallized the two protein structure first is the cadal receptor which is recently crystallized in 2019 and second is the sweet transporter so by looking into these uh, transporter, we can see that both of these transporter are adopting the same structure fold, that they are having the seven transmembrane region. And these seven transmembrane region are arranged in two triple helix bundle, which is connected by a linker helix, which is TM4, triple helix, uh, which is the linker helix number four. So when we superimpose these two structure, we found out that the RMSK value is quite low. 
RMSD value is quite low, which is 1.05 angstrom. So we were curious that how two functionally very diverse protein are adopting the same structure fold. So in order to uh, do so, we want to first know about all the residues which are uh, conserved between, firstly in the cradle and in the sweet. Then we want to compare them. For that, we develop a methodology where we extracted the data from the uniprot and then we clean the data where we remove all the sequences having more than 98% sequence identity. Then we remove all the false positive result from our data and did a structure based sequence alignment. From that alignment, we identify all the uh, residue which are conserved in cadal receptor and did a phylogenetic analysis. So all the important uh, finding from this uh, pipeline were compiled in the form of a repository known as DB cadal receptors. So similar work has been uh, used previously in our lab to develop another repository for the sweet transporter where the variation in the sequences are present. So next we want to compare these two uh, se uh, sequences from these two protein and found out what are the uh, residue which are important in both of these protein and conserved across the protein. So this is the representative logo uh, for the two sequence, uh, protein sequences across all the kingdom where we can see that this is the uh, triple helix bundle 1, triple helix bundle 2 in case of sweet transporter and here the cadal receptor uh, logo is presented. So uh, from our analysis, next we did is a phylogenetic analysis for the cadal receptor. So we found out that cadal receptor are classified in the three cl major clades. Clade 1 is a fungi which is represented in the red color here having 608 members. Clade 2 is planty having 429 members and the clade 3 is metazoans having the 658 members. So these three clades are having some similarity but also some differences. So some of the differences we can see in the right side that some positions are different. And we also did uh, uh, identity and similarity amongst the clade and between the clade. Next, when we compare the residues between the sweet and cadal receptor, we came to know that there are 20 positions which are conserved, then chemical nature was conserved. Like if there is hydrophobic residue, then it is conserved. But we also find out that the, the most conservation is then in the helix-helix interface residue. So as we know that helix-helix interfacing residue are important to maintain the integrity of the protein. Next, in this movie, we can see that uh, the cadal receptor and sweet transporter structures are superimposed and all the conserved residue, 20 conserved residue are present here as are color-coded aliphatic hydrophobic weakly polar aromatic polar and glycine and proline residue which are conserved. So from this study we conclude that there are uh, helix helix residues which are very conserved and which suggests that these two proteins are this is this can be one of the reason how these protein are having functional differences but still are structurally adopting the same fold. So uh, currently I am using molecular dynamic simulation to determine uh, recognition and transport mechanism in the cadal receptor and uh, also I am using umbrella sampling to determine the selectivity mechanism in the sweet transporter. Last but not the least I would like to thank my guide Dr. Shankar and also my lab member and HPC facility and IIT Kanpur for providing the assistance for the fellowship. Thank you. So the next student speaker is uh, Dr. Mr. Amal Jude Ashwin. Oh, good morning everyone and welcome to my talk on the topic one minute cognitive physiology signals are able to predict the treatment outcome of depression as early by two weeks. 
So the research work is done by myself, the one with a secular name Amal Jurashwin, under the guidance of Dr. Pragati Bal Subramani, with the support of my colleague Mr. Hari Kumar Tiwari at the Translational Neuroscience Lab, Department of Cognitive Science, IIT Kanpur. We are collaborating on this project with Dr. Aloj Bajpai and Dr. Nandini Priyanka Balasubramani. Suppose we have a person who is feeling really low and hopeless and is willing to seek professional help. When the person visits the clinician, the clinician diagnoses the participant based on something called PHQ-9, which is a nine question questionnaire that covers the symptoms of depression. <coughs> So we have symptoms of depression like uh, hopelessness or thoughts of suicide, the differences in appetite or sleep pattern. So the nine questions score from zero to three each, where zero corresponds to healthy and three corresponds to depressed participants. So therefore, it's a zero to 27 questionnaire. And based on the answers given, the person is diagnosed with depression and is recommended medication, which is the first line of defense. And the clinician asked the person to follow up after one month. But the catch over here is antidepressants work only for 40 to 50 percent of the patients who are prescribed medication. So what about the remaining uh, 50 or 60 percent? One month is definitely a long time to wait to see if the medication is working because depressed participants tend to go to extreme measures. Therefore, can we reliably early predict the treatment outcome? So we have the baseline PHQ-9 from the clinician and the follow-up after 30 days. We propose to use EEG at a follow-up visit at 7 to 14 days. So using the change in EEG values, can we reliably predict the change in PHQ-9 scores as well? To translate it better, can we reliably predict change in mental health using the change in neurodynamics across visit 1 and visit 2? That is as early as 7 to 14 days. So in order to do that, we collect the EEG signals while the participant is performing very simple coordinated tasks like eyes open, eyes closed tasks, the breathe in, breathe out task, and an MMSC which is a questionnaire that tests your cognitive ability and finally varying frequency photic task where a light blinks at different frequency. It's a cue attention task. So we extract EEG features and along with the EEG features, we also feed in the demographics of the participant and the answer, individual question can answer to the questionnaires that they are performing. So we collect the demographics and questionnaires during the first visit itself. So we feed it to a predictive model. In our case, it's a logistic regression model and predict if there is change in positive change in mental health or no change in mental health. So we collect the data, we pre-process the data and we extract EEG features such as a functional connectivity measure which is called coherence and various band powers. So we scrutinize the EEG features based on three criteria. So criteria one tells us if that particular EEG feature can distinguish healthy and depressed participant. Criteria two tells us if that particular feature is sensitive to the change in mental health. And criteria three tells us if that sensitivity to change in mental health, is it reliable or not? <clears throat> so based on these three criteria, we filter the EEG data and we add the demographics and the questionnaires and we develop a predictive model. So we perform sequential feature selection to further scrutinize the features and we end up with a bunch of 14 features which are a part of demographics, uh, the EEG features as well as from the questionnaires. So the coefficients that we see over here are the logic, logistic regression coefficient values for the corresponding predictors. So we were able to predict with an accuracy of 95%, that is 46 out of 48 participants, we were able to predict if they are showing positive change in mental health or no change in mental health. So we performed stratified five-fold cross-validation to get the following metrics. And when we plot, plot the sum of weighted activation, which is taking each predictor over here and multiplying it with the corresponding coefficient value and summing it up, 
we can see a clear difference between the participants who are showing no change in mental health and positive change in mental health. When we change the y-axis of this plot even better, when we plot the sum of weighted activation against the PHQ-9 difference, we can observe that for participants who are showing positive change in mental health, it follows a linear trend. So therefore, we can also predict if they are responders or they are remitting to the treatment that they have been given as early as two weeks. So in order to further explain the results, when we go to a clinical setting, we can't just go with the model. We have to explain <coughs> why for that particular patient, they are ge getting predicted as whether they are showing positive change or no change. So in order to do that as a future direction, we have to explain the neural features that we are extracting and also provide subjective analysis. To validate the results of the model that we have got, we are collecting further patient data and we are hoping to scale it to other treatments for depression like the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation or even uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Or in the future, hopefully the same methodology, if it's foolproof, can be extended to other mental disorders as well. So to conclude with, mental health matters. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. The last speaker is a B.Tech student, Kaushik Raj. So hello everyone, I'm, my name is Kaushik Raj Nader and I am a fourth year undergraduate student at IIT K, pursuing a dual degree MS in Statistics and Data Science and a B.Tech in Biological Sciences and Bioengineering and uh, now I will discuss my work on pattern recognition for electromyography signal which I did as a summer internship at Life and Limb Private Limited. So first, what is the, uh, what is a prosthetic device? So it is basically an artificial device uh, which is a functional replacement for a missing or an amputated uh, limb. And uh, this diagram shows the basic components of the of a prosthetic limb. So it consists of three components. One is the terminal device, which is which contains the microcontroller, the motors, and the battery. And uh, one is the shell, which provides the structural support for the device. And uh, other is the third is the socket which actually, which is the main contact with the skin and con uh, contains the surface electrography, electromyography sensors. And uh, bas how, basically how it works is the sensors record the electromyography signals from the skin of our hand. And uh, based on th those signals, the microcontroller decides which motor to activate and controls the hand. Uh, so the current problem in this is that uh, basically there is a button for each, there are presets for each uh, activities which we can do with our, uh, uh, with the prosthetic device and using that button on the terminal device, we can switch between different modes and uh, there is a certain threshold after which uh, the certain, after which the EMD signal detects and uh, the certain motors are activated. but in this model, the problem is that uh, every time the user needs to switch to different activities, he needs to uh, click the button using uh, his other hand. So it is very incon inconvenient for him. So what I have proposed is using a machine learning model, which can automatically detect which uh, grip patterns the microcontroller needs to set and which motors to be controlled uh, for each uh, finger movements. And before workflow, I will talk about how I collected the data. So basically, I had a, I created an automated UI uh, which con contains a timer, and after each five seconds, basically the gestures are alternated between a rest gesture and a non-rest gesture. So for each there are uh, for this project, I chose twelve different non non-rest gestures, and uh, 
collected data only for those gestures. So after every five seconds, in the first five seconds, the, uh, the patient had to perform a rest position using his hand. In the next five seconds, he has to perform any uh, non-rest gesture which was uh, controlled. And in this way, data of around two minutes was collected for each gesture. So this is how I made. And so the overall workflow, basically we, and uh, I'll also formulate the problem. Basically the problem is that uh, we, the input is a time series EMD signal and the output is uh, basically the classes of gestures which we need to predict. So it is a multi-class classification problem. So in this workflow, uh, we have the time series EMD signal as the input to channel and we perform segmentation on those signal, which is basically a sliding window of around 25 to 100 data points, whichever we choose. And the, uh, this window is uh, a slide. Uh, this window is used to perform segmentation on the EMD signal. And for each windows, there is, we perform feature extraction and the feature vector is associated with that window. And also a label is associated with that window and the label is chosen by uh, uh, choosing whichever is the ma majority label in the in the 50 to 100 data points and based on these uh, segmented windows we perform multi class classification we train the machine learning model on the these these two uh, 12 non dust gestures and we get the final prediction so the first I tried using traditional machine learning models. So these were the results which I got. Uh, these are very pretty good for traditional machine learning models. These accuracies, uh, which are almost every uh, all the models give about ninety percent accuracy. Although the problem here was that I had used a window size of around hundred, which corresponds to around one second. So which ha which means that there was a lot of delay between. Uh, the gesture and the prediction. So to reduce, to, to optimize this problem, I try to reduce the window size and perform the prediction, but the accuracy dropped drastically to around 60 to 50%. So, so these models are not useful in the practical scenario. So I went on to perform, uh, went on to use deep learning for this task. So I chose two different types of architecture. One is the convolutional neural networks and one is the recurrent neural networks. So convolutional neural networks are known mostly for their uh, ability to capture spatial variation in the data. And the RNNs are known to capture sequential variation in the data. So uh, I decided to choose these. And you, if you see in both these architectures, I have a common, uh, uh, common thing. In the first layer, I have uh, in the first layer basically I am doing a projection such that the lower two-dimensional data, two-dimensional EM, uh, EMD data is projected into a higher dimension. So this I think acts as a decomposition uh, uh, operation for the signal, and it captures more uh, patterns in the data. So after that, it is mostly the uh, mostly a simple CNN or RNN. So using these models, the results which I got were uh, really good. And as you can see in, on the right that even after reducing the window size to 20 to 50 milliseconds, I was able to get uh, very good accuracy of around 90, 90, 99%. So, and also I, I would like to mention that I had used, uh, I had implemented attention mechanism for this. Like in this diagram, I didn't, um, I have not shown the attention mechanism. So attention mechanism is basically a weighted sum of all the hidden input, hidden states of the RNN. And instead of just using the last hidden state, so it gives a better uh, prediction. Also, uh, I have tried, also the attention mechanism gives us a good visualization of how the model is trying to learn. So we can see using this attention heat map that where the model uh, attends mostly while learning the data. So 
yeah and the i would also like to talk about the challenges in this like uh, currently this model the, these models were tested using uh, done on the computer so deploying it on a microcontroller can be a diff very difficult task as it will require more compute resources and uh, also like for deployment what we can do is we can uh, send the data co collect the data on the microcontroller and send it to a cloud computing system which will train the data train the model and then it will uh, send the we can download the model from the central system and then deploy it on the microcontroller and uh, in and uh, modern developments in tensorflow and pytorch uh, as such that after we compile the model they, they have very good optimizations in such a way that the inf inference time can be reduced a lot so these are the future directions and uh, thank you all thank you kaushik that's a very interesting area uh, so that brings the end of the digital medicine uh, session and uh, <clears throat> and i would like to thank all the speakers i mean very interesting session and uh, so please join me in thanking all uh, the professor shankar subramaniam uh, professor priyanka and then all four student speakers uh, thank you uh, so i have one small announcement uh, we are running little late the next uh, next is tea break uh, it is supposed to be from 11.30 to 12, but uh, we are going to have a very short tea, ba tea break. So we'll, ba we'll be back at 12.15 to interact with the international speakers. Thank you.
ओके, सो वेलकम बैक आफ्टर द टी ब्रेक आई होप या आई एम ऑडिबल so welcome uh, back to our podium uh, dr shankar dr bau and dr anna uh, we have a informal session right now with our guests in classroom guests who would like to interact with our students especially and of course uh, faculty can as well do that so we can ask actually about anything uh, that you can have uh, queries about maybe internships projects how does it work in the us time zones <laughs> so yeah feel free uh before that maybe it will be nice to have a brief interruption especially from dr anna because we have not heard from her uh, about and it's i think it's a really an interesting thing we have an md doctor in internal medicine which is uh, not that usual in india so Thank please uh, if you Thank can you Uh, please Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Anna Maria, and I'm Shankar's wife. We have been married for more than 30 years, or so. I think of myself as uh, an adopted Indian lady. And uh, I also have the privilege uh, of uh, being an Italian lady. So two cultures that uh, are really go well together. We're, when I met him the first time, I thought, OK, he's like one of my guys, you know, one of the people you meet back, uh, back in Sicily. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, welcome all again for your warm welcome. Um, I'm here now today as uh, an ex-physician. I worked as a physician for 40 years, after which uh, I decided it was the time to hang on the stethoscope and enjoy my life and my family. Uh, it is true that once a physician, you keep being a physician. You know, I keep asking why, and I keep asking for some kind of a problem. I always look at the negative. He always look at the positive. Perfect combination, neutral vectors, right? Um, I enjoy today a lot of the presentation, and especially uh, the presentation by Dr. Priyanka, because I really related to everything she was saying. Most of everything else was above my head, you know? If it, I'm waiting for you guys to give me something concrete and small that I can actually use. But I really related to everything she said. Um, and I can see the potential for what she was proposing. Uh, after that, I'm here and I'm happy to answer all your questions about uh, medical involvement, about application in uh, uh, the clinics uh, of the uh, bioengineer 
development. Uh, many possibility, drug delivery, and most importantly, what is important from my point of view, point of view is delivery of medical care. Because the biggest problem is delivery of the medical care. Uh, the IoT is uh, such a beautiful concept. I didn't know that there is a word for that, right? It does already happen. And it happens not in substitution of the doctor's skills and work, but to complement. Because the physician sees you for 15 minutes. And probably when you see them, you, the complaint you have is not actually happening. And they tell you, OK, go home and make a note so when it happens. But it's not like actually monitoring home. So applications in electrophysiology in cardiac patients or diabetic patients or patients at risk for fall, like patients with neurological or neurodegenerative disease, that would be phenomenal for the doctor because they can have a 24 access to assessing the patient and assessing response to treatment changes. So after said that, I think I took enough time. I'll pass the microphone to the real scientist. <laughs> yeah, maybe a few words from Dr. Bob. I mean, about. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity. So um, I, I guess I um, just briefly um, introduced my lab. Uh, my lab has two major directions as I shown yesterday. Uh, one direction is uh, nanomedicine. Uh, in the past, we have done a lot of different um, nanomedicine work uh, with uh, go nanoparticles, with quantum dots. But finally, we decided to focus on iron oxide nanoparticles because those nanoparticles are non-toxic. Uh, they have received FDA <coughs> approval. The coating is biocompatible. As I mentioned again yesterday, that if you deliver nanoparticles in the body, in the end, uh, many of the, them uh, accumulate in the liver. The uh, liver actually decomposes them into ion water. And the liver actually uses the ion right, uh, for making blood, in a way. Uh, so, uh, so that's why we. Uh, focus on this class of nanoparticles. Uh, the gene editing work actually uh, was, uh, we started uh, 2008, <coughs> was not my choice. <laughs> In fact, uh, it was um, based on a suggestion by a NIH program officer. Uh, at the time, I knew nothing about sickle cell disease. I never heard about it. And the program officer said, you might want to look into that. So I, as a center director, I organized a workshop. I invited uh, uh, experts uh, in the field. At the time, actually, we did not really have CRISPR-Cas9. We had the uh, zinc finger nucleus. Took my lab two years to really make good zinc finger nucleus. Then we jumped to so-called tailings in 2013. <laughs> when uh, two papers published in Science uh, CRISPR uh, editing in mammalian cells, we quickly switched to CRISPR. So um, it's truly amazing that over the last 10 years, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing now very likely will be in clinics. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if FDA approves this application by Vertex, uh, we will see treatment in the clinics. Just 10 years, that's truly amazing. Yeah. So the future is bright. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, since I talked a lot over the last two days with most of you, I'm going to tell you something completely different. I want to tell you what it is to be a student. I think of myself as a lifelong student. The approach I take and the approach I take in my lab, I want to tell you mainly because it's inspired me over years to deal with education and research in the following way. I'm very confrontational with myself, and I expect my students to be confrontational with me, not in an aggressive, negative way, but confrontational in a scientifically aggressive way in learning. I expect them to ask me the toughest questions which will make me think. Working hard is much easier than thinking hard. You, won't, you may not believe me, 
but just sit down in a room try to think very hard about a problem divorce your mind from absolutely everything else i'm going to tell you today that you may think you know how to do it you don't know how to do it it takes a lot of effort to learn to come to that point it's almost like yoga at some level where you've got to empty your mind of everything else so question first suggestion please challenge yourself challenge your mentor the thing i learned when i was in india in fact all my teachers and all my mentors in india hated me because i would never i would not say sir or ma'am everything is fine thank you i would never do did that so therefore they thought i was a rebellious bad individual i always asked questions i didn't ask questions because i wanted to humiliate anybody or make anybody feel bad i asked questions because i genuinely want to learn when i go to a seminar i always ask questions because it's not because i want to show off knowing that i do it's because i don't know and i want to learn and so that's the approach that i take and i strongly urge you all of you never showing respect is not equal to accepting everything everybody is telling you they are not the same my philosophy is you command respect through stature and not demand respect through status right i hope i make that very clear it doesn't mean i don't respect my professors or my colleagues or my students or everybody is but you've got to challenge yourself to learn that's integrity in learning i'm strongly suggesting to you to adopt that attitude towards learning second as a student first thing i tell my students when they join my lab is number 1 they have to read voraciously i expect them to read at least 50 papers research papers a year i mean a, a week 50 papers a week how do you do it i actually have a video presentation on how to read effectively a research paper and i can make it available to all of you you can look at it and my students claim that it helps them in terms of learning how to read 50 papers in one week's time right and read voraciously second if you don't try to be critical self critical of yourself you're never going to make progress i mean you've got to ask a million questions of your things and it is not about just being dogmatic about what you know it's about being i mean thorough and being thorough means that you've got to ask all kinds of questions some may be just irrelevant some may be relevant but ask the questions i tell my students when they graduate they need to know hell of a lot more about what they have done than i know if they don't do that then they have not succeeded in adopting in accepting doing what they have done so to me i want to leave you with this idea that the process of being scientific is not just embracing the idea of being a scientist the idea is one of constantly challenging yourself challenging others science does not look for truth science looks for consistency and the inconsistencies are what cause disruptive breakthroughs in science this is really really important if you're always trying to say this is truth this is ex excellent great then go to religion don't go to science right science does not believe in truth it believes in consistency in fact almost all major discoveries came because of non acceptance of adopted dogma so this is why my sincere suggestion not because i know anything more than you is only because i have white hair i'm telling you please challenge yourself and challenge others i loved the questions many of the students asked today it was really fabulous this is the way to go so thank you i'll let you interact with us instead of my saying more things great thank you dr shankar now in the backdrop of such a nice philosophy can we have questions uh, especially from the students please uh, was well, okay there is no wrong question yeah. remember that yeah. you can always ask no silly question everything is important Good afternoon, uh, ma'am and sir. Thank you for the um, inspiring points. So, uh, uh, I wanted to ask a very general question. So, how did you get into research? What was the moment for you to define your career? Because 
I think that is very essential for someone to decide. Yes, I want to do this. Maybe for the next thirty or forty years, or maybe till I die. Maybe, maybe your turning point when you decided. Do you want to actually quit or do you want yeah. to? So I, I I must tell you I always was fascinated by science since I was very young. But I'll tell you the turning point that happened to me. I lived in this city called Madras, Chennai. I don't know if you know that. I mean, lived in a area called Mount Road which was really in the thick of population. There were, I mean, even at the time I lived, when I was young, a lot of people. So when I was in element, not elementary school quite, but middle school, I first went to this American library, which was in Mount Road in Madras, Chennai. It used to be called U uh, UCIS, USIS, I think, United States Information Service or something like that. So I went there, I walked in, and I was at that time, I was in sixth grade, I was nine years old. And when I walked into that, they the lady in the front told me, did you get lost? I mean, she was really very kind, and she asked me, did you get lost? And I said, no, no, I just want to check out the books here. She said, OK. You know, she said, we don't have children's books here. I said, it's OK, don't worry, and I'll go and look at it. So I saw that when I went in, I saw one book which said the structure of the atom. It was by Isaac Asimov. I still remember that vividly. It's really a simple book. And I looked at it, I said, let me read this. So I sat there for the next hour and a half or something like that and read that book. And they told me that this is really a brave new world. I really fell in love at that point in time with the with Atom. And, and then that started, triggered, I always wanted to be a scientist, but that triggered me, my love for science. And then I never, in fact, I was so fascinated that many of you don't know this, but my doctoral dissertation was in quantum mechanics because I really fell in love with the uh, atom and atomic structure. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, I mean, um, something like the 60s, right? So therefore, we are not talking about that near. So it really was, I was really, I mean, fascinated at the time with this uh, amazing idea of knowing something about something what we cannot see. And then I went through the journey, and then I realized that quantum mechanics can tell you certain things, but I don't really understand about living systems. I never took a course in biology, never took a course really in engineering. I told myself, you know, I challenged myself to learn these things, and that's how I got into uh, systems medicine and systems biology. So it's a question of uh, what you passionately care for. And some, I should tell you, I'm also, I mean, uh, to some extent, uh, what is the right word? Um, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, I mean, I have. Uh, some deficiency of trying uh, attention deficiency disorder. So I, I have to really do a million things before I can feel happy about certain things, which is a flaw, actually. I, I strongly advise people to pursue their things and continue along a direction till you are mature at a point where you can really, I mean, attend to many things. But being passionate, think of it as a commitment. Don't think of it as a profession, as just a profession that you're going to get into. So I'm sorry, but I took a longer time. But that no, no, that's fine. Uh, Doctor Bar, do would you would like to add something to? I mean, in your journey, what was your turning point uh, to get into science? Yeah, similarly, I had a pretty complex path to uh, bioengineering. Uh, my undergraduate studies uh, were in mechanical engineering. Uh, then I did a master's study in mechanics. Then uh, I came to the U.S. to actually, uh, I was at Lehigh. Uh, it was in the applied math program. <laughs> so my PhD thesis was uh, using group theory uh, to analyze crystals using uh, symmetry properties to identify the form of uh, constitutive equations. So then I uh, did my postdoc at uh, um, UC Santa Barbara for simulation modeling. I did not really do any experiment. So then I uh, went to Johns Hopkins as a young faculty member. The first few years at Hopkins, I was really just focused on mechanics of composites, doing a lot of finite element modeling, uh, a lot of mathematical modeling because of my background. Now what happened was, as you may know, uh, Johns Hopkins has one of the best medical schools. Uh, the Department of Biomedical Engineering 
has been in top three for many years. So I had a lot of colleagues uh, in that department uh, while I was working on composites really for uh, all three uh, DOD branch, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army. So I still remember it. One part of my friends um, telling me uh, half jokingly, uh, they said, your work is really to develop weapon systems to kill people. We are trying to save lives, right? Why not just uh, transition into biomedical engineering? Actually, initially, I, I didn't think that would be a good idea, but after going back home, I thought about it. I, there's a truth there, right? So then uh, I thought about transitioning into biomedical engineering, but how? Because um, as you mentioned, I, at that point, I did not really know anything about cells. I don't even know what kind of shape of cells. I, I knew nothing about the protein, all the stuff. So what I did was I actually spent uh, one month at UC San Diego uh, as a mini sabbatical. And just so happened that uh, YC Fong, Bird Fong, uh, just retired uh, a few months before that. So I was very, very fortunate to be able to spend a, a lot of time talking with Professor Y. C. Fong. As you may know, he was the father of the uh, whole bioengineering, biomedical engineering, of course, father of uh, biomechanics. So I asked him, I asked uh, Professor Fong how he made the transition in the mid 60s from purely fluid mechanics to bioengineering. So he told me uh, his story and was, he strongly encouraged me to move into bioengineering. So I then took my sabbatical, uh, learned uh, cell biology, learned biochemistry. When I went back to Hopkins, I established a small lab uh, doing experiments. It took me actually five years in order to get a um, grant in biomedical engineering. So now I'm doing almost purely uh, cell and molecular biology, right? So, so that's my pass. Thank you. So yeah, in brief, you need to think more about doing those and get the motivation out. Uh, next question, please. Yeah. No, okay. So maybe you uh, tell your name and what you're doing, and then maybe start your question. Uh, thank you very much yeah, for the meeting. Sit and ask. Uh, Thank you uh, so much for the amazing talk. Uh, I'm Dave, a uh, fourth year undergrad here at IIT Kanpur. So uh, like you just said, uh, Professor Shankar, that initially you were interested in molecules, uh, how atom actually, you know, what's the shape, and then you slowly made way to systems biology. That's like you're getting a broader picture of everything. So I want to understand from you, what was the transition point for you where you understood that, okay, this small element is not where I want to look at. I want to understand it from the broader picture. So how was, and, and again, uh, from Professor Gangbao, but how did, I mean, you said that the transition is difficult. It took you five years. That makes sense. But uh, apart from it, you must have faced a lot of challenges. If you can just, you know, elaborate on those uh, so that, you know, we can relate. Because in today's world, we won't be facing it. Okay, I want to do uh, mechanical or... Uh, I mean, everyone will face something different. I mean, we have plethora of options. So when we want to shift, it's always like, you know, there are so, there's so much competition. There's so much of, um, you know, people doing out great. So I can't fall back. I need to continue in that direction. So yeah, the challenges in shifting and all that, that will be really good. I'll try to be very brief and then give it to Dr. Gangbao. So, I mean, clearly, making any changes and transitions is never easy. It is not that, you know, your people will tolerate you and give you tons of time to do things and so forth. So it's, it's a matter of how you execute these things. So this is uh, not a science, but it is really a art at some level on how you execute these things. I'll tell you my journey uh, for just for started. So when I did uh, quantum mechanics, I realized when I went to do my postdoctoral work, that uh, I can continue doing it, I'll be okay. I mean, maybe even get a job and do things like that. But I asked myself, is this something 
that I'm passionate about in terms of thinking. I said, the mo I mean, I also, uh, reading widely makes your mind open. So if I, the thing that may open my mind first towards this complexity and towards system thinking was Ludwig Boltzmann's approach towards statistical mechanics. So Boltzmann said, I mean, when you take atoms individually, they behave in a certain way, but collectively, the way things work is the most probable distribution. This is a fundamental, we never think about it seriously, but it's fundamental. This is the foundation for thermodynamics, right? So that really caught my attention. So I started working on liquids and complex systems to look at how to understand from a perspective of liquids, a complex, I mean, a number of molecules, the behavior at the atomistic and molecular level. So then I attended a bi biology, a computational biology slash biology symposium or workshop. I asked myself, is there a way for me to really play, understand these things, living organisms and living systems in a meaningful way? So that triggered my thinking. And I already was an assistant professor at the time. And so I told myself, I've got a chance of trying to do something disruptive or get tenure and be happy. And so everybody will think something. I told myself, okay, you know, you live once. Therefore, take a chance and see what uh, you can learn from doing things. You know, it's not as if, you know, you can always be in a steady state and then say that I'm going to just continue along these lines. So I said, no, you know, I want to just try something new. I was very fortunate at the time that all the DNA sequencing was just starting at that point in time. So when I tried to just play around with the DNA sequencing, I realized there were no tools and no infrastructure that was available. And so you had to pay $40,000 to a company called GCG at that time, I'm talking about early 1990, to be able to do anything with the DNA sequencing. And universities were getting a cheap rate, companies were paying $200,000. My neighbor at the time was a guy who invented the World Wide Web in Beckman Institute. He would belong to the National Center for Supercomputer Application. I used to talk with him and I asked him the question, how about if we try to do all of this uh, sequence stuff, bioinformatics, at the time it was not called bioinformatics, sequence level biology, using the World Wide Web as a mechanism for intruding. And he said, it's, uh, he said, I don't know anything about it, but I think it's a possibility. So in the next two years, we created the very first approach towards internet-based, web-based approach to all of uh, biological data at that point in time. I had the very first patent on web-based informatics in, it's in 1995, right? That is what really told me that there's an opportunity for doing something really disruptive in this field. And when I moved to San Diego, it was absolutely, the reason I moved was very simple. School of Medicine, the medical school in San Diego is very good. They had a lot of patients, they had a lot of exciting stuff. I told myself, I'm tenured, nothing can happen to me. I really want to work hard towards uh, trying to see if I can make a difference. So that's what kind of motivated me, drove me. But I'm crazy, so therefore you have to be crazy to some extent to do these kinds of things. Yes, thank you. Uh, similarly, I, I would like to see that. Uh, do not feel like uh, uh, you already know a lot of things. You do not need to learn new things. Always, always, you need to learn new things. Uh, so not afraid of learn new things, that's very important. So in my case, actually, when I was at Hopkins, uh, decided to transition into biomedical engineering, um, I, I was already a social professor. So a lot of people said, you are crazy, right? And why you want to abandon whatever you have been doing in modeling uh, mechanics of composites and uh, moving into something uh, you know nothing about it, right? So, so it it, it, it was a challenge, but but uh, looking back, I really um, I'm happy that I made the right decision to move into biomedical engineering. So again, just uh, make sure that you now always always learn new things. I don't really want to add, but I would like to compliment. As an outsider, I'm not a scientist, and I never knew what I wanted to be. And I found myself in a medical school just because I liked that my cousin was in the medical school and everybody thought he was a good guy. And uh, I became a physician, 
But my second year of the medical school, I was ready to quit because I felt I cannot do this. It requires, uh, it, these people are way too smart than me. You know, I cannot reach the same height. And then of course, uh, um, you know, these, these feelings are common. Everybody has them. They become a concern when they last so too long. You know, if they last six months, then you have a problem. But if they last six weeks, then you are just uh, um, processing and trying your, to find your path. My path was not really what I was doing, but how I was doing it. And it's sort of very common to what they were saying. Challenge yourself, be diligent, and try to do always your best. Don't try shortcuts unless they are reasonable, unless they are true and um, honest. Don't try to cheat. When you go around, don't look, don't look at people like competitors. They are your collaborators. So the more, the better. Yeah, there will be competition when it's a job, but it's like in a tennis game, you know, it's like in a soccer game, you know, we are, we are all good there, you know, sometimes it's luck, sometimes. Uh, so look for collaborator, don't feel, uh, uh, don't feel like you cannot do it, you can do it, you just have to challenge yourself uh, and keep checking what you're doing. And most importantly, be resilient. You are not born a scientist, you become uh, by continuously correcting your mistake. That's what nature keeps doing it. You know, our DNA does, uh, as the system to correct itself is bigger than the system to process itself. So it's a skill actually that is even more beneficial than knowing exactly what you want to do when you are a kid. This, this guy must have been special, you know, they knew it. The reality is 99% of people don't know what they want to be. They will learn as they get exposed because every time you uh, come, you finish a project, that gives you adrenaline rush, that gives you happiness, and it takes you to the next step. So resilience, I think, for me, and honesty, mental honesty, and uh, reaching out to people around you like your friends uh, is what really sustained. My best time when I was in school, my best time when there was my residency because the time we spent in the daughter's lunch to just check on what we were doing and how I was doing something and how the other person was doing was absolutely the best time. And that's what I wanted to add, you know, don't think that you are alone thinking, oh, I, how am I going to accomplish this? That's what 99.99% of the people do and those that don't do it, they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're a little, flamboyant, let's say, or too self-confident. That's, that's my comment. That's a very positive way of looking at it. And actually, that is that helps. That definitely helps. Oh. So there will be a lot of challenges. He forgot to tell you that I think he likes, he, many of his changes were dictated by the fact that we did not collaborate, but we did interact. So he was the guy that was listening every night, every night when I was home. I can't believe it. I had to spend one hour because the patient could not remember what I was trying to tell them. So that's an example. He became essentially interested. How do we fix this problem? You know, <laughs> there is a problem there. Great. Thank you. So yeah, next, please. So it has been really generous your answers. Who, yeah. Okay. So thank you for your generous answers on so many questions. So I am Abhishek, uh, currently pursuing PhD uh, in IIT Kanpur. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, so first one is uh, like after completion of PhD. Uh, so usually students are confused whether to pursue a completely new topic or whether to extend their current research. So could you share some views on that? And second thing, uh, like uh, since uh, we are focusing more on engineering and medicine, so we want interdisciplinary research that focuses and collaborates both academia as well as healthcare. So in that light, could you share some of your views, how the clinicians perceive the researchers and the researchers perceive the clinicians? Like 
how could we make better collaboration that could uh, enhance the research output so i mean in the interest of time the so first question i think both of you have already answered that you should ask what you are interested in right i mean yeah i just want to add, add it's very tough to get a postdoctoral position doing some com something completely different from what you've done for your research if somebody applies to me who has worked in uh, uh, for example archaeology and wants to do a postdoc in my lab i'll say thank you you're a wonderful person wonderful idea but i can't afford to hire you so therefore this is not a, so you've got to really do it in a way where you have an opportunity to get an opportunity excel in what you're doing in your postdoctoral work you cannot afford to just jump ship right after your phd it's very difficult i'm not saying it's impossible there are people who have done it but getting positions is not very easy just to caution you about this issue and and my own postdoc went to doing continuing what i did as a phd student at some level but then i decided to bifurcate and gradually shift away from that point right so uh, but the second question for the to, interaction yeah. between clinicians and uh, scientists so yeah. that may be both anna and you i mean both of you or you and anna you want to start with uh, dr anna well is a complex is a complex interaction uh, is filtered by um, the needs of real life and real work before for clinician. We should enjoy the development and wait for them and implement, uh, but our timings are much slower than research timing. And there is a need for a lot of filter because many of the things that are proposed that they are not easily applicable. Uh, th that distance is becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. Today, I really enjoyed uh, the presentation by Dr. Priyanka. I don't remember her uh -huh. last name. Yeah, but that was phenomenal. It was wonderful because it has already started. And uh, but what she was uh, showing was uh, the amplification of the potential. So there is absolutely, absolutely a strong connection. Uh, the timing is getting shorter and shorter to translate from basic science into medicine. Uh, it, the, that translation is possible if the, your department would collaborate immediately with the medical school or with the clinic. So the fact that she's doing that, uh, it was phenomenal. Um, that's my, my comment about it. I just want to add, very quickly, two things. Number one, I want to tell you that uh, physicians don't have the luxury of having extended discussions and understanding in patients and learning the language of an engineer. So my own interactions, I interact with a lot of wonderful, amazing physicians. And I do it because I spend a lot of energy and time learning their language and trying to speak to them in a way that makes sense to them, and then try to do translate that into ac actionable items. I can give you a number of examples, but I want to tell you the second part of what I was going to tell you. When you think like an engineer, you've got to, re I always like this uh, Leonardo da Vinci. I don't know many of you know, have read his story. He has a simple book called A Codex for Flying Birds. It's just about 30 pages or 40 pages. And it's an amazing book because what did he do? He said, okay, he looked at a bird flying. He told himself, how do I make something that mimics the bird fly? He didn't say, okay, I'm going to do a computer simulation to do this stuff. He didn't have computers or anything like that. He said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make detailed measurements of the bird. So he designed equipment, designed instruments to make these measurements. He designed the vernier calipers, what is called the vernier caliper. So he could measure, measure precisely the buoyancy, the wingspan, the airflow underneath. He did all these measurements. Then he went to the design, to his workshop, and then he designed what is currently known as the helicopter. It's called the Ornithopter. In fact, in his book, it's called the Ornithopter. Um, I mean, uh, Bill Gates actually has the original drawings, which he bought for uh, millions of dollars. He has it in the Smithsonian. Now he's donated to Smithsonian temporarily for holding. So the point is, what did, what did he do? He did, he observed, made measurements, used the measurements to build a model, translated the model into reality. Interaction with the physician. Let's go back to the interaction with the physician. You go to the physician and ask the question, what is the problem? Let's make measurements. Let's translate the measurements into engineering models at multiple scales. 
Then we ask the question, can we solve this problem in terms of being innovative, in terms of building devices for detect detection, building therapies for uh, cure? So that's really the approach. I take the Da Vinci approach because this is really the right way to think about how to bring engineering into practice in medicine. So I would like to add that for engineering in medicine, uh, if you are engineer or you are scientist, if you want to do research for medicine, you have to interact with medical doctors. There's no other way, because a lot of um, cases, engineers uh, develop tools, um, but they do not really understand the basics of medicine. They just try to apply tools here and there, but they don't really understand if the tools uh, uh, applicable or not, right? It's just trying to use your tool without talking with uh, doctors, that's a huge mistake. You need to understand what are the med medical need, what are the solutions that can be uh, used or developed for addressing those medical problems. You need to understand that. Otherwise, you can do all kinds of things, but there's no impact. Thank you. Just one Thank last you for the answers. burning question. I mean, just one last. Oh, <laughs> so there are three people now. You guys have to. Three questions. <laughs> okay, quick ones, please. We can have a shorter lunch. Short, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, thank you so much for your enlightening sessions, and uh, I look forward uh, for the future ones as well. Um, I'll just cut it short uh, in the matter. Uh, previously, I worked with uh, different domains for translating the uh, engineering into the um, medicine and everything. So I, I would definitely like to the, uh, know the perspective of both clinicians as well as the scientists on this mental health. Previously, I worked with mental health. We have had uh, this uh, particular uh, kind of phenomena where your stress is actually reflecting in your voice. And the voice pitches were, were actually being utilized for measuring the stress at, the, at particular instances. Suppose if some part, this person is breathing heavily and then he is speaking and then he has meditated for 20 to 40 uh, uh, minutes and then he is speaking. So there were there were a significant difference uh, uh, in the voice pitches and the energy. Um, I worked previously with a uh, uh, company, a startup, 3GS Systems, who was actually developing this model for stress measurements uh, on a telephonic uh, platform. What I want, actually wanted to just just for the, with this example, I wanted to know how these uh, models or why these particular kind of measurement techniques are not coming very forward and very drastically to actually change our lifestyles, give us real time data, and why we are no uh, why clinicians or the sci see scientists are developing these kind of uh, fundamental discoveries, but uh, in, on a clinician stage they are not making very much impact. They're not coming into regular habits. So I just want to know the perspective that how we can tackle them. And also, the one, one bigger challenge is that how to maintain a positive mental health during all those years of you know struggling into research or making a career out of it. So I, I will uh, uh, try to uh, answer your first question. It goes back to the question that Dr. Gangbo was saying. It has to be a, med a clinically relevant problem. So describing uh, uh, the, the, your example would describe a problem, but not actually ask the question of how to eliminate the stress. A physician would rather ask for a way to eliminate the stress as opposed to uh, measure the stress, because they already measure the stress. So um, the best interaction is when uh, the clinical problem is actually asked by the clinician. And uh, th th that is inevitable. Yes, physicians have a little problem understanding numbers. And uh, you are working with an illiterate person when you talk to a physician. Um, but the, the when the collaboration uh, is established and lasts, that the language, technical language, gets transferred both ways. So the scientists understand more what the clinical problem is, and the clinician understand what the scientist is trying to say. 
um, but you have got to start with the clinical need. So for example, again, going back to Dr. Priyanka, uh, she was talking about monitoring patients with Parkinson. She was talking about the expert that can make the diagnosis. Um, and she was presenting the uh, algorithm, the IoT algorithm to, to predict. Uh, it's not for diagnostic purposes, for example. A physician can diagnose a, a Parkinson person just just in five minutes looking at them. Of course, it ha he or she will have to prove it and demonstrate, but you get that gut feelings immediately. The real problem is how do you monitor when he goes home or how when you are not in contact or how do you monitor treatment changes? So the three questions there are actually asked by the physicians and the scientists at that point will provide the help. So always start with the clinical questions uh, rather than, okay, I found the technology and I need a place where to apply it. Uh, it's the other way around. I find the problem and I need to find the technology to fix it. That's well, next question. And for the next question, uh, so they were asking in general about the positive, how to keep a positive mental outlook, right? That's yeah. uh, the My question one. is for Anna. So as a lady, you have encountered a lots of ups and downs in your life. So how you uh, maintain the balance between your personal and professional life in the initial stage? Then what are the driving forces? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> because Jen... Oh, sorry. Yeah. What are the driving forces that motivates you throughout your life to achieve your goals? So as uh, a human perspective, I just want to know that. That's a million dollar question. Uh, and my answer is individual, it's not collective. I've been lucky because I, I've never exper experienced really discrimination. But I know that doesn't happen in a lot of places. Maybe I've not experienced it because I've set my goal lower than I could have reached. But I don't care. So what had motivated me and kept me in the game is my sense of diligence and duty. Do the excellence and do the best of what you can do. We are very different from my husband, from this point of view. So for me, I just want to do my things well and care for what I'm doing well. And that is, so I, uh, my judge is myself. Whatever everybody else says, it doesn't really matter to me. I have to live to my standard of excellence. And my standard of excellence is not perfection. It's just make sure that I put the effort and that, uh, you know, sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. When it's not okay, there was a reason. So for me, it's about uh, finding the reason. Discrimination uh, is uh, nothing to do with that. And again, I don't have an answer for the millions of women that uh, have suffered it. I really am not. Uh, I don't have an answer uh, other than uh, um, just persevere. Just persevere and don't let it bother you. A comment, a bad look, just, just uh, ignore. Because the more, the more you dwell on it, the more actually affects you. Just pretend you didn't hear it. That's, right. that's my way. OK. So thank you very much. I think actually that uh, actually answers both your and your question as well. So first, let's thank uh, Dr. Bao, Dr. Shankar, and Dr. Anna for the nice interaction. And we uh, break for lunch right now. We meet back at 2.30, if I'm not wrong, the next session. Thank you. Bye.
we're, we're just waiting for a minute to have the people at lunch to walk over. We'll start in a minute or two. Good afternoon and welcome back to the last session for today, session 3, which is on the third main uh, objectives uh, that have been listed for MFCEM on uh, regenerative medicine. We have two invited speakers, uh, Dr. Samik Sen and Dr. Jayendran Rao. And we have four student presentations after that. Uh, so I'll start uh, with the introduction of the first speaker, uh, Dr. Shamik Sen. So Dr. Shamik Sen also happens to be an alumnus of IIT Kanpur. So Dr. Shamik Sen um, is currently a professor at the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering at IIT Bombay. So he earned his BE degree from uh, in mechanical engineering uh, from Jadavpur University in Kolkata and his MTech degree here at IIT Kanpur also in mechanical engineering. Then he moved to University of Pennsylvania or UPenn in Philadelphia where he earned his PhD in mechanical engineering in the lab of Professor Dennis Disher. Before uh, joining IIT Bombay, he, he did his postdoctoral fellowship um, at uh, UC Berkeley which is University of California at Berkeley uh, in the lab of Professor Sanjay Kumar. So uh, Professor Shamik Sen's interests or lab focuses on understanding the mechanobiology of cancer metastasis and regulation of stem cell fate, particularly how physical features of the ECM including stiffness, uh, porosity, topography, geometry, ligand spacing and dimensionality influence cell behavior. With that brief introduction, I would invite Dr. Sen to come and give his presentation. Thank you. So uh, I would like to begin by thanking uh, Dhirendra for inviting me to be a part of this inaugural symposium 
It was a pleasure meeting so many colleagues of IIT Kanpur. So many colleagues of IIT Kanpur whom I knew before and also many more whom I got to know here. Of course, part of lovely presentation since yesterday. And you know, so since my master's days at IIT Kanpur, I've held IIT Kanpur very close to my heart. So whenever I get the opportunity, I do visit here. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is our work on you know, understanding and engineering the stem cell niche using the model system that we have worked on. So as uh, many of you would know by now that tissues in our body possess distinct physical properties. So if you take a tissue, just a simple extensional a measurement of how much is the strain, how much is the stress. So you can backtrack the slope of this line corresponds to the Young's modulus of the material. Of course, this is in the linear range of strain. And uh, depending on the tissues of our bodies, of course, blood is completely fluid-like, brain is very soft. And as we go to stiffer tissues, which are load-bearing elements like bone, they are very stiff. So there, there is, of course, a very strong correlation between the physical properties of these tissues and their functions. And to a great extent, this scaling in tissue... So to a great extent, the scaling in tissue stiffness is very closely correlated to the collagen content which is there in a tissue. So collagen is one of the most uh, essential elements of any tissue you talk of. So when you talk about crosstalk between the cells and the matrix, you, you know, do understand that this, uh, this crosstalk is highly dynamic. To begin with, the matrix is secreted by cells themselves, right? Of course, and in the given tissue, depending on the composition and organization of the extracellular matrix, you can have distinct phenotypes. As is very evident here, this cell has aligned along the collagen fibrils and is exhibiting almost 1D-like migration. The cells can also degrade or physically remodel extracellular matrix. So this is an example where a cell is actually pulling on a single fiber. So in a sense, this crosstalk is highly dynamic. So during my PhD work in Dennis's lab, by tr we had focused on understanding the role of the stiffness of this matrix. And what we showed was if you take mesenchymal stem cells, you put them on something very soft like which mimics the bulk stiffness of brain tissue, these cells predominantly differentiate into a neurogenic lineage. Similarly for the stiffer tissues, they, gener they differentiate into an osteogenic lineage. In the context of cancer, which is also another area of our interest of our lab, what is very well documented now is the extreme stiffening, tenfold stiffening of the tissue surrounding the tumor. In fact, there have been seminal work done by Valerie Weaver. She was initially at UPenn, then she moved to UCSF. She showed that just by stiffening the matrix, I can actually drive cancer progression. So, now this stiffness sensing, how does a cell know what is the stiffness of the tissue around it? That the cell knows by actually pulling on it. So this actually this observation that cells sense the matrix properties was documented back in 1981 when fibroblast was seeded on thin silicon membranes where you could see the induction of wrinkles but in a time dependent manner suggesting that the cells are sampling their microenvironment. And this uh, sensing is critical to stiffness different, different, differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells as well. So at one end, you have the cells which is physically anchored to the outside, to the extracellular matrix through focal additions. The, at the other end, these forces are propagated all the way to the nucleus. And at the nuclear end, you have the lamin, uh, lamina composed of lamin A and lamin B. Uh, lamin AC is the splice variant and lamin B1, B2, which actually regulates how the chromatin within the nucleus is going to be rearranged. And similar to the very strong scaling of collagen content, similarly the lamin A to B stoichiometry is exhibits a scaling behavior. On very soft substrates, you have more of lamin B expression, less of lamin A expression, vice versa. So we have been focusing on this dynamic crosstalk in the context of cancer, stem cell and tissue engineering. But today I will uh, you know, uh, limit my presentation to mostly whatever we have been doing 
in the context of embryonic stem cell differentiation. This is the work of two of my PhD students, Lakshmi Kavita Sthanam. She has graduated long uh, some time back, and my current PhD student Tanusri. So uh, our model system here, we chose those embryonic stem cells. So these cells are isolated at the blastocyst stage and from the inner cell mass. And so in a sense, this is an entirely in vitro context, right? Because this whole thing is happening in vivo. And, you know, uh, scientists have, you know, found out that if you can culture them on a layer of mouse embryonic fibroblasts, which are typically a feeder cells, then the ESCs, you know, form rounded colonies, which are pluripotent. And then you can then subject them to various differentiation assays. Alternatively, these ESCs can be cultured on gelatin coated dishes, which media is supplemented with leukemia inhibitory factor. Okay. Now, when we uh, when I started working on it, I was thinking that how is these two systems physically equivalent? Is there something is, is there something which is different between these two systems? And that is where we, you know, and typically the way these experiments are set up from the time you, you know, you seed your fibroblast, it takes almost a day to two days for the, you know, matrix to form a confluent monolayer and then you are seeding these ESCs. So in all probability, the ESCs are actually seeing the matrix which is secreted by the fibroblast and not directly the fibroblast themselves. And of course, in addition, the soluble factors which are secreted by the fibroblast. So, what we started working on was we, you know, by tuning the contractility of the MIFs, we generated what are called cell derived matrices or MIFDMs as we call it. So once the cells secrete their own matrix, we get rid of the cells and what we are left with is our cell derived matrix. We can tune the composition uh, or bulk properties of these MIF derived matrices as is shown here from the ester staining or to the collagen 1 and fibronectin levels. And we then asked, as to how do ESCs respond to these matrices and what we found was when we in the so leaf is plus leaf condition is a pluripotent condition so cells are supposed to express high levels of ox4 and in the absence of leaf you know they start to differentiate but if you see that when we uh, supplement leaf with lysophosphatidic acid which is an activator of rho kinase pathway you begin to see a loss of ox4 so suggesting that what leaf is doing is actually keeping the cells in a poised state. They are somehow preventing the cells from mechanoadapting, which by you can you know tweak that balance by adding LPA. So you promote cells to have more contractility, then they will begin to differentiate. So it is this poised state which is maintained by these cells. So these observations, 3D organization of the you know colonies which is uh, uh, cultured on them also show that in the presence of leaf you have colony height is high, colony volume is more which means that the cells are uh, actually proliferating while maintaining their pluripotency there was a lot more BRDU incorporation into such colonies but on the you know minus leaf conditions you see that this, the colony volume is less, colony height is less which means the cells are beginning to spread laterally. And Long term culture when we do then we see that a stiffness dependent induction into an osteogenic lineage. So this was suggesting that the MEVTMs first of all the composition you can tweak but in this particular case we did not have much control over the fate of the ESCs that they were differentiating into. And so but what this data showed is that you have an inverse relationship between ESC contractility and its pluripotency state. So if you can inhibit the contractility, the cells will remain in a pluripotent state. As you begin to, you know, cells start to feel, they start to spread and then you will have a prominent loss of pluripotency and induction of differentiation. We then next ask that, okay, can, they, can we devise a simple way in which we can change the composition and organization of the cell derived matrices itself? And we thought that why not? perturb with contractile agonists which impinge on the fibroblast the way their, their shape is the way they exert forces on the matrix and what we uh, what we generated by using various inhibitors of contractility such as nocodazole ml7 lpa so uh, uh, nocodazole is actually a microtubule disrupting drug but indirectly it has been shown to you know activate myosin contractility so and what you can clearly uh, appreciate here is so not only is the composition of the matrices secreted by these cells distinct, 
but their organization is distinct as evaluated by this fiber anisotropy as well as the bulk properties. And we then did a microarray profiling of these ESCs and what we could show was depending on the composition of the cell derived matrices, we could actually guide them into relatively different early lineage commitment. It is not differentiation at all. This is, you know, just early lineage commitment. And, uh, and you know, based on, so we actually profiled various germ layer specific markers and well as common markers and we could show that, okay, on these CFDMs, there's an ecto endo meso type of differentiation. So that means that they are beginning to differentiate, but they have not exhibited any lineage specification. While in this uh, MEVDM and LFDM, which were among the stiffest, here we are seeing a prominently endodermal differentiation part. So we looked at the integrin expression of these cells and based on the highly expressing integrins, what it seems is that most of the cells are actually early on engaging laminin and then subsequently fibronectin and collagen. So in general, when you make a 3D matrix, though we think that the ligand is there, many times it is not accessible and the cell needs to actually remodel or degrade the matrix in order to make those binding sites available. So to assay that, we looked at the expression of MMPs and we could see again, like to our surprise, the expression of a plethora of MMPs of which MMP11 was, you know, highly expressed across all the MFTMs and 2 and 17, so on and so forth. We looked at how many of these, at least among the soluble MMPs, MMP2, MMP9, which MMPs are secreted and we could detect MMP9 in the conditioned media which the cells are secreting, which, uh, which actually remodel the matrix. But to our surprise, we could not detect any MMP2 though it was present in the cell lysate. We took a closer look at the MMP2 localization and to our surprise, we found that MMP2 primarily exhibited a nuclear localization. So even though MMPs are you know, traditionally thought to actually be remodeling the matrix, there's increasing evidence suggesting that it is also in, in, you know, involved in remodeling the chromatin and other functions. And uh, we, these are some preliminary experiments which we did as to how does the microenvironment influence the localization of MMP because its localization it's, it will dictate its activity, what protein it is working on. And what we found that MMP2, MMP9, both of them have, first of all, on something very soft, MMP2 exhibits primarily nuclear localization. As you begin to stiffen the matrix, this MMP2 kind of exits out of the cell as evident in the zymogram. And this localization to a great extent is actually dependent on the force on the nucleus. So if we perturb the ectomyosin activity, then what we begin, we, we begin to see that the pore size has decreased and the nuclear retention of MMP2 has increased. So this gives a physical picture as to how MMP localization can itself dictate what it is doing. Now, when we inhibited the MMP activity, what we found was we could actually tweak the differentiation pathways. So this was the second part where we could show that by tweaking MMP activity, we could actually direct, redirect it from the pluripotent state, we could redirect its differentiation trajectory. Now, one observation, intriguing observation which we had on the MEVDMs was when we culture these ESCs either on the MEVs or on the MEVDMs, the genomic integrity was maintained to a much greater extent, but not so much on gelatin coated dishes where long term culture was leading to extensive am aneuploidy. And we were wondering whether this has to do with the substrate itself because either the MEFs or the MEF derived matrices are reasonably soft in contrast to the stiff gelatin coated surfaces. So to address this question, what we did was we fabricated polyacrylamide gels, which is a well-defined elasticity. We uh, fabricated a range of them, 0.6 kilopascal, which mimics the stiffness of these ESCs themselves and then one order of magnitude stiffer. So what we found was these ESCs actually mechanoadapt, so which we can either assay using the spreading. So you see on the softest surfaces, the cell spreading is nearly insignificant over a period of time versus cell stiffen and then there's some saturation in spreading on the stiffer surfaces. And then we asked that, okay, so is there 
is this differential spreading driving any kind of DNA damage to the cells? And which we assessed both using gamma H2 staining as well as comet assay. And here we could see extensive DNA damage on the stiffer surfaces. What is it associated? So we first wanted to rule out that this is not because of ROS. And we use this ROS uh, scavenger in acetylcysteine and we did not observe any differences in the extent of DNA damage, suggesting that there must be some other factors. And we looked at the shape of the nuclei that gave us a clue. So what you're uh, looking at here is the side view images of the nuclei staining. And you can clearly appreciate that in contrast to the soft surfaces, as you begin to stiffen the matrix, the nucleus is extensively spread out. And which we measure here using the nuclear height. So you see a gradual drop in nuclear height. So this is a clear association suggesting that there might be a physical origin to the DNA damage. And we, uh, you know, we assessed whether there is the, the compression is actually driving the DNA damage. So what we did on the very soft surfaces where the cells don't spread much, we treated them with manganese chloride, which is known to activate integrins, thereby leading to, you know, uh, the cytoskeletal reorganization and pulling on the nucleus. So this led to a prominent drop in the nuclear height and a corresponding increase in the extent of uh, uh, DNA damage. Contrast on the stiffest surface we treated with blebistatin, which is relaxes the cells from exerting forces. We found the reverse effect. You see a drop in spreading area. There is increase in nuclear height and a corresponding decrease in the extent of DNA damage. So this indeed suggests that nuclear compression, which is a physical activity, is driving the DNA damage. So surprisingly, when we looked at the status of pluripotency markers, what we found was as with increase in stiffness, at the 24 hour time point, there was a prominent drop in pluripotency markers and a prominent increase in lamin AC levels, suggesting that Okay, maybe the nuclear lamella is protecting, trying to protect against this DNA damage. And this was also observed when we treated these cells with very low doses of etoposide, which induces DNA damage. So again, we found that prominent induction of lamin AC expression and prominent drop in OCT4 uh, uh, pluripotency markers, suggesting that this is like an, uh, a, a mechanism which is fairly robust. Even when we did the cells, incubated the cells with known differentiating agents such as retinoic acid or aspartic acid, we asked, so do we observe such a DNA damage phenomena early on? And we did observe evidence of DNA damage early on, which then of course dropped at later time points. And this also led to induction of lamin AC expression, suggesting that this DNA damage is somehow coupled to regulation of the fate of the cells. So this uh, is RNA-seq data which suggests that at longer time point, 70 to 72 hours, there is a differentiation into an ectomeso lineage, though there is no stiffness specific differentiation, but there is a differentiation nonetheless. And this DNA damage, which was initially high, over a period of 72 hours, this is actually resolved. So is it that the DNA damage is initially driving a differentiation phenotype and then the DNA damage is going down? So we looked at activation of DNA repair pathways and we found ATR was increased across all the stiffnesses over a period of time, which we could, which we verified using phosphorylation of ATR. We did not observe any activation of ATR, suggesting that DNA repair is partly driven by ATR. And what is ATR doing? So to address that question, we incubated these cells with either an ATM inhibitor KU or an ATR inhibitor V. And what we observe is with the ATR inhibitor, there is drop, prominent drop in the lamin AC expression, suggesting that this ATR is what is regulating the lamin AC expression. So we also establish knockout, uh, you know, lamin AC knockout ESCs. And we find that in these cases, so if you can clearly appreciate from the pictures of the nuclei, then the nuclei are very abnormally deformed. And that is, there is a corresponding increase in the extent of DNA damage. So based on these observations, we document a physical mechanism by which DNA damage induced by coupling of the cytoskeletal to the nucleus can be a 
driver of differentiation and this leads so there is a nuclear compression this is because of the mechano adaptation mediated cyto nuclear cytoplasmic coupling that leads to a DNA damage response a loss of pluripotency laminacy expression and a subsequent exp uh, you know activation of DNA repair factors which then drive differentiation by induction of laminacy. So in summary uh, what I have discussed is how showed how cell derived matrices can not only be used as a substrate for understanding gaining insight into how stem cell fate is regulated but also from a very regenerative medicine application standpoint you can use these substrates for expanding ESCs without causing genomic instability which is an absolute requirement if you wish to use these cells for cell therapy based applications and we are uh, DNA damage you know is a mechanism of ESC differentiation we do see a lot of nuclear localization of MMPs we are now trying to see whether there is any connection between MMPs and the DNA damage. So with that I thank you so this work I presented has been done by uh, Kavita and alumni and Tanushree and we thank DBT for funding. Thank you. Thank you Shamik for a very nice talk. Floor is open for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Shamik. I mean, two questions for you. One is, have you looked at uh, the chromatin topology changes using either ATAC seq or even chip seq, genome-wide chip seq? Yeah. So you can start looking at uh, what are the transcription regulatory factors which are altering it. And my second question is very intrigued by your aneuploidy. A comment. I was curious to know if uh, uh, you looked at uh, what is the nature of the aneuploidy in terms of the molecular composition of uh, which chromosomal regions are yeah. replicated and how, what is the uh, consequence for uh, the transcriptome of uh, the cells? Yeah, so this is a very relevant question. So to answer your first question, those experiments are currently ongoing, you know, so we are trying to see whether these locations where this DNA damage is happening is it stochastic or there is some specificity to the process. If it was stochastic then that would be very dire consequences for the cell. So that we are trying to integrate. For the second part beyond looking at the chromosome number we have not delved deep into the aneuploidy aspects of it. So you think it's a stiffness that is driving the aneuploidy or is it something else that is driving the aneuploidy? So we think that what the stiffness is doing is it is causing this DNA damage and even though we see a differentiation when we did a cell cycle analysis we could see a sizable proportion of sub G1 cells. So these cells you know so we need to take a closer look at these cells suggesting that the DNA repair may be inefficient and depending on the outcome of the DNA repair even though it might be partly corrected but that will lead to you know still survival of the cells and then ongoing of aneuploidy. Could you use for the stiffness part could you use AFM to look at uh, the alterations with the force that manifests itself subsequent downstream into your uh, alteration in your uh, DNA damage and other cell cycle processes? You mean the measuring the properties of the cells yeah. and nuclei? Yeah. Yeah. No, so which we have already done. So mm -hmm. there is prominent you know cytoskeletal organization but in embryonic stem cells because the cells occupy the 90 percent of the cell volume is the nucleus yeah. so what we measure we call it an effective stiffness okay. so we do see a prominent increase in the stiffness Hi Shamik, nice uh, talk. So just one question, is there a physical molecular interaction that you observe between the nucleus as well as the cytoskeleton? That's how the cytoskeleton would be imparting to the nuclear stiffness that you talk about? Uh, so, so imparting the connectivity, right? Yes. That is by virtue of the cytoskeleton, right? We see increase in phosphorylation of myosin light chain and that is what is you know causing the nuclear it's pulling the nucleus so the nuclear volume is roughly preserved so as a consequence when you're pulling on it laterally the height will decrease 
So these physical interactions you have observed uh, with the myosin or the actin to the nucleus? Uh, so, you know, uh, in ESCs, if you do a staining, it is very diffuse. Mm. So only with perturbation experiments and, you, could, yeah. you know, these measurements, you are able to clearly, you know, say. All right, thanks. Hello. So, hi, uh, fantastic talk, uh, first of all. So, my question was, you mentioned about the POI state, uh, mm. about those cells after we add LP or LIF, and and uh, you talk about the DNA repair pathways as how they are correlated. So, do you think those cells are in a uh, senescence mode of cell line, uh, cells uh, fate? No. So, in the, when I said POI state, I meant that they can, they are ready to differentiate, but they are not committing it. So they, in those cells, because they have not mechano adapted at all, you are preventing the mechano adaptation. So they are completely in pluripotent state. But whenever you remove withdrawal relief, they will start to differentiate. Okay. So they are not in a senescence mode. No, of this, this is a pluripotent state only. Okay. But so they are, and so also twice to differentiate. So uh, you already mentioned about some sub G1 stage. Uh, they are, do, do, do you think they can be uh, transformed into G0 stage? So that they cannot be differentiated, and you add uh, those differentiation mark differential factor, then they start uh, differentiating in the new forms. That is an interesting point. We have not looked at it. Uh, we see that you know there is not much apoptosis at all. Okay. There is a steady fraction of necrotic cells. So the sub G1 cells are actually undergoing necrosis. Okay. So we have not looked at the G0 state. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shami. Um, I'm asking from the perspective of a developmental biologist. So the way we look at it, that the cell differentiates, and uh, along the that process, it creates the ECM, which is the destination stiffness or physical characteristics for that cell type. Uh, while the data that you presented, you are providing the destination characteristics and putting embryonic stem cells in there uh, and you you are observing that they are going towards the the fate that is appropriate for that uh, you know environment so i'm a little bit uh, you know curious to know that uh, why should the cells do that because normally the cells would be coaxed by other signaling molecules and they will secrete the ECM, create the physical stiffness and go further. So just uh, I thought so, that so, I would uh, like to know yeah, from so you. I think this is a very valid concern. So <clears throat> from the perspective of you know usage of these stiffness controlled substrates, the reason why they were used was you could actually control their stiffness and hold it. Okay, But that said, that one of the critical aspects of the in vivo environment which they don't recapitulate is the remodeling okay and that is why the cell derived matrices you know serves as a good source for us to assay because there is an existing matrix but this is also constantly remodeled by the ESCs so uh, a data that I did not show you is that uh, in the context of ESCs on these different cell derived matrices within a period of four days whatever was the initial stiffness of the matrix, it dropped nearly by 50 to 75%. Okay. So, it's, so ESCs are actively remodeling that. Okay. That is an aspect which is missing in the, you know, uh, PHL studies. But the reason we had to do follow this approach, because when you are doing with cell derived matrices for which we can vary the stiffness, there's also so much of composition which is variable lot of growth factors are actually sequestered within the matrix which you know makes it very difficult to parse the role only of stiffness that's the reason why we kind of use these in vitro substrates to gain some insight but then even on the cell derived matrices when we went and looked at the gamma h2x level there also we see that there is this gamma h2x induction suggesting that this dna damage seems to be an early program so the way i would like to think of it is it that the dna damage is enabling reorganizing of the chromatin which is so that then you have you know genes which are existing in multiple chromosomes 
can be brought closer and co-regulated. So, th so the next step is to actually identify what is there some rule as to which of these sites in the chromatin are particularly susceptible to forces. So that way they can dictate the way this fate will be regulated. Yeah, so thanks Amit, uh, nice work and very uh, uh, great observation. So my question is related to the way experiments are done. So uh, did you first uh, coat the surface and then you grew, grew the cells on top of that or you first grew the cell and then you put the material to study the... In, in which context are you asking? So this? wherever you are uh, measuring the this uh, mechanical... No, no, uh, so of course we always, you know, coat the surface. See, right. these PHLs are inert. You have to functionalize it with your ligand of choice. Right. So uh, in, in if, if you are doing that way, uh, uh, don't you think that it, testing should be when uh, it is uh, in the middle of the same material rather than being on the top of the surface? You mean in a completely 3D context? Yeah, right. So then so, probably uh, it might give some other kind of uh, no, so interaction. Of course, you know, so the dimensionality angle will matter. So in that context, the cell derived matrix is a much, you know, it really recapitulates the in vivo environment in terms of its molecular and organizational complexity. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from the context that because if you, if you are growing on top of the material, then it creates a, a interface of the uh, fluid and uh, the semi-solid and then their uh, cells are growing and then... Uh, no, no, so the cells are in physical contact with the substrate. The fluid, you mean the media itself? Yeah, on top so of the, it, you will yeah, having so the so. Yeah, of course, the cells are submerged. Right. So if the they media. are, they are having mechanical interaction both sides on the yeah, top so of the. Yeah. So for the... that, one needs to do a you know complete three D culture. Right. Okay. So. So, the, but the problem, you know, uh, main challenge with three D culture is whenever you want to subject it to any kind of molecular, uh, you know, process, just getting the RNA yield will be very low. So you will be completely handicapped. Thank you. Thanks. So our next speaker is uh, our very own uh, Dr. Jayendran Rao. So quickly to introduce Dr. Rao to you. So Dr. Rao is currently a professor.
preventing septic implant failures in osteoporotic hip fractures in red. So let me start with a brief overview of osteoporosis. It's a disease that weakens the bone and enhances the risk for sudden fractures and bone fractures as shown in this uh, video. So what happens in osteoporosis is there is a destruction of the bone homeostasis and there is increase in bone resorption that takes place because of the enhanced activity of osteoclasts and World Health Organization has given a criteria for diagnosing this osteoporosis and it has given that based upon the bone mineral density of the bone and the T-score calculated from it, the T-score range of minus 2.5 or less is considered for a patient to be osteoporotic. So what happens is that whenever such type of fractures occur in an osteoporotic patient, it is fixed using several implants which includes K-wires, screws, dynamic hip screws, etc. And this situation worsens whenever there is an infection in these implants as well in the osteoporotic patients. So the major causes of these infections include open fractures or any type of surgery or secondary surgeries. The major bacteria involved in this osteomyelitis type situation is Staphylococcus aureus. So this is the infection that occurs in these type of bones and it is considered one of the most serious complications in orthopedic surgeries. And there is a requirement to enhance the strength of the bone so that the secondary implants that will be implanted do not fail again. So this, there are very limited strategies that are available to treat such type of uh, issues. So we have designed a study where we have designed the structure like that. We made an implant associated osteomyelitis model in an osteoporotic rat where we utilize nano cement based carriers for delivering several bioactive factors and antibiotics at the site of fracture so that we can achieve bone remodeling, infection control and improved mechanical strength. So in the first phase of the study of this experiment, bilateral overectomy was carried out in which BMD T-score was calculated and as per this formula, uh, different regions of interest were taken which were supposed to be affected by osteoporosis and we have seen a significant decrease in the T-score values in all of these uh, regions of interest in a period of three months which was in the range of minus four which is the range that was provided by WHO and in the second phase of this experiment we created a fracture in the femur head canal and then we have infected it using S aureus mediated K wire implant and then in a period of 14 days, this is the DEXA image of the same and these are the harvested K wires in a period of 14 days. So what we observed during this time of 14 days, there is a significant decrease in the weight of the animals and TLC and DLC values of the animals have significantly increased. So in our treatment strategy, we have utilized nano cement as a carrier for different type of bioactive factors which was shown here in three animal groups which includes the combination of MSC exosomes and zoledronic acid. In this group 4 we can see it is the combination of BMP and zoledronic acid whereas in the group 5 we have utilized the combination of all these bioactive factors in addition to rifampicin as antibiotic. So what we observed after a period of 4 months using DEXA analysis that there is a significant increase in the bone mineral density and the T-score values of the treatment groups has reached the normal range. These are the micro CT images where we can see enhanced bone remodeling and the micro CT parameters we can see in the treatment groups bone volume by tissue volume percentage has significantly improved in the treatment groups and if we see a trabecular number it has also significantly increased and there is a decrease in trabecular separation showing that good fo bone formation has taken place in the site of the defect. So also as I mentioned the mechanical properties are very essential so what we see is that the peak fracture force that is required to break these bones after the treatment has significantly increased so that the secondary fractures can be avoided. The bacterial load analysis done for the ex vivo samples isolated from the rats shows that in the treatment groups we are not able to find the bacterial colonies as well. The histological images, uh, histological analysis shows a significant improvement in cell infiltration and collagen deposition in the treatment groups where we are able to see in these treatment groups cells has infiltrated, infiltrated in the fraction site and collagen deposition has taken place in the fracture area. So we can conclude from this study that successful bone regeneration and infection control were achieved and with these bioactive molecules and antibiotics which were loaded in the nano cement. And these MSC exosomes, they are showing a potential alternative for BMP2 in bone regeneration when used in combination with zoledronic acid. I would like to acknowledge my thesis supervisor, Professor Ashok Kumar, BSB faculty and staff, Animal Facility IT Kanpur, DBT for my PhD fellowship and all previous and 
current lab members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aman. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Rafat Ali. Uh, good evening to all. My title of talk is Hydrogen Sulfide Releasing Peptide as a Multifaceted Approach to Alzheimer's Disease. So as you know, Alzheimer's Disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder in which human lost their thinking ability. I will explain how was the Alzheimer's Disease by taking the famous example of <coughs> William Ottermullen who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. The first picture he was painted before he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and later pictures he was painted after the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So you can see that painter was not able to draw his self-portrait. So you can imagine how badly the Alzheimer's disease affected the human thinking ability. So if you look at the factor, Alzheimer's disease is a multifactorial disease. Uh, and several factors like uh, oxidative stress, protein aggregation, degeneration of cholinergic neurons and so on leads to the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So due to multifactorial nature, Alzheimer is generally considered an incurable disease. So we need a molecule which will target multiple aspects of Alzheimer's disease. So in this context, hydrogen sulfide will emerge as an important player and in human brain it is shown to display significant neuroprotective activity uh, such as it will increase glutathione level and it is given radical species and it was observed that uh, in Alzheimer's disease patients have low level of uh, hydrogen sulfide in their brain and it is very difficult to deliver hydrogen sulfide from outside due to its gaseous nature. So, Several inorganic salt and small organic molecules were developed by the scientists to tackle this, this uh, to deliver uh, uh, this hydrogen sulfide from exogenous source. But uh, from these molecules, it is not possible to deliver hydrogen sulfide in the control manner. So we come up with the strategy in which we design and synthesize hydrogen sulfide releasing molecule, hydrogen sulfide releasing actually peptide conjugate one and two, which will formed by combining this H2S releasing molecule with these anti-aggregating peptides. These peptides will form self-assembled structure in aqueous solution and due to self-assembly it will release hydrogen sulfide slowly and in sustained manner. So as I have told that deposition of A-beta in the brain is the main culprit of Alzheimer's disease. So we uh, evaluate our peptides for their ability to inhibit A-beta aggregation for that we perform this thioflavin T fluorescence assay and in this assay we found that our peptide conjugate was significantly reduced the A beta aggregates. This was further confirmed by this atomic force microscopy imaging. If you see the first column, uh, you can see that after 24 hours of incubation, uh, the A beta start to form this fibril like structure whereas in presence of peptide conjugate, no fibrils were to seen for in vivo system we use this C elegance form these C elegance have cytochrome P450 and, and a DPH enzyme which allows uh, in vivo release from these type of molecule and with the help of this cumarin we can uh, quantify this hydrogen sulfide release inside the C elegance because in presence of hydrogen sulfide this molecule give green color fluorescent molecule so if you look at the fluorescent micrograph you can see that these uh, conjugate 1 and conjugate 2 treated C elegance form have show more green color fluorescent which correspond to more hydrogen sulfide inside C elegance. For A beta aggregation we use this transgenic C elegance form which will express human A beta protein in their muscle. If you look at this untreated form this white deposit or blue deposit is nothing but A beta aggregates and when we treat these C elegance with our co conjugate there is a significant reduction of A beta aggregate was observed. So moreover these peptide conjugate were significantly reduced this 
reactive oxygen species generated by hydrogen peroxide inside C elegans. So actually what happened these A beta aggregate and reactive oxygen species mainly degenerate the cholinergic uh, neuron which will result in the low secretion of this important neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So we found that our peptide conjugate was significantly increases the acetylcholine in transgenic C elegans form of uh, C elegans model of Alzheimer's disease and we conclude that decreased oxidative stress and a beta aggregation by our peptide conjugate is mainly responsible for this increase of acetylcholine. So in conjugation we have developed uh, hydrogen sulfide releasing peptide conjugate which will target three important factor of Alzheimer's disease and we observe significant reduction in this A beta aggregate and uh, this reactive oxygen species as well as we observe significant increase in acetylcholine level was observed in C elegans. So our future plan is to test uh, these peptide in mice model of Alzheimer's disease with the hope to recover this neuronal loss caused by Alzheimer's disease. So finally I would like to acknowledge my mentor Professor Sandeep Verma and all, all the collaborator involved in this work funding agency and thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Preeti Sati. Good evening everyone, this is Preeti Sati and uh, today I am going to talk about my research topic membrane free labor on a chip for drug screening purpose. So well uh, first of all uh, testing experimental drugs with human first is very risky and challenging process. Also drug discovery with the uh, conventional platforms and we, with the animal models are not, are not that effective, time consuming and expensive processes. So to overcome these challenges, microfluidics and tissue engineering are working towards to develop novel organochip platform for drug screening purpose. Well, uh, inspired by organochip platform, liver on a chip can be the better alternatives to the animal models and the conventional models because liver plays the main important role in drug metabolism. So if we closely if we closely look at the structure of this liver, so we can see that uh, liver is made up of the thousand of the lobules and in each lobule, because liver is made up of the 90% of the hepatocyte cells, so uh, hepatocyte cells in the liver are arranged in the hepatic cords, see the hepatic cords and uh, uh, separated by the uh, liver sinusoid which are the vascular channels and which the endothelial monolayer cells are flanked. So these hepatocyte cells are separated by the uh, endothelial cells and they are not directly exposed to blood flow. Uh, in fact, they fed by the nutrients and media via diffusion. So to mimic such kind of uh, complex architecture or we can say to mimic such kind of uh, two tissue interface in uh, liver on a chip, chip platform, previously people have... Uh, Then people have utilized these microporous membranes and micropillars in the inside the channels. So these microporous membranes are we can see that separating the two cell types and we can see that uh, these microporous membrane inside uh, in the bottom channel they are protecting the hepatocyte cells from the shear stress of flow and also from the pores of this microporous membrane the uh, mass transfer is from there. Similarly, in the uh, micropillar base chip, uh, between the spaces of these micropillars, the flow can be introduced and that's how they are protecting these hepatocyte cells from the shear stress of flow. So, uh, but these models have the limitations that these models cannot, the membrane cannot completely remove the convection on the hepatocytes. Also, uh, these kind of model are uh, construct, uh, constructing the 2D platform because if we can see that these uh, hepatocyte cells in the bottom channel, they are uh, growing in two dimension and they are actually fails to mimic tissue structure and functions because they are not properly getting the native 3D microenvironment. 
So uh, to overcome these challenges, we have designed a membrane free sing uh, single channel membrane free liver on a chip where we have utilized the uh, PGDA hydrogel as an alternative to the membrane which is overcoming all the uh, challenge of challenges of the membrane. So uh, this PGDA hydrogel is also modified with the CGRGGS peptide. Uh, which are the cell adhesive peptide and uh, first of all we have encapsulated the Hep G2 uh, liver cancer cells and fibroblasts in, inside the hydrogel and then we can see that the uh, these PGDA hydrogel not only protecting the hepatocyte cells from the shear stress of flow but also the mass transfer was, was there and via diffusion the Hep G2 cells are getting the nutrients and the media. To achieve our final step, we have done the peptide immobilization over the surface of this uh, cell encapsulated PGDA and uh, that is how uh, after 24 hours of seeding Huvex cells, we can see that the with the help of self assembly, these cells are forming the monolayer. So that is how we have achieved our membrane on a chip uh, platform. This, uh, this model is actually can also be act as a 3D liver tissue chip. Uh, so to approve our model, we have done some uh, FDA stain, uh, live staining of the uh, encapsulated cells and the, uh, the cells over the hydrogel. So we can see that the, these uh, Hep G2 cells inside the hydrogel are uh, with the um, passing day, they are uh, proliferating inside the hydrogel and also these Huvex cells also um, covering the uh, uh, surface of the hydrogel. Well, uh, because this model give the functions and viability up to 15 days, so we have uh, tested the live dead analysis up to uh, for 15 days. So we can see at each passing days, these cells are uh, not only encapsulated cells, but also the, uh, the surface cells are covering the full hydrogel. Uh, we have also tracked these uh, mono layers uh, with the green tracker and uh, these uh, encapsulated cells with the red tracker. So we clearly can see the difference that how these uh, hubic mono layer are uh, covering the uh, su upper surface of the hydrogel and the red cells are showing the encapsulated cells inside, uh, encapsulated inside the hydrogel. So uh, now finally we have tested the liver specific functions, urea secretion and albumin secretion. So uh, we can see that the, we have observed that this model is giving functions and viability up to 15 days and uh, the maximum function is up to a uh, ninth day but in the 15 day itself the uh, function was more than the first day. Similarly the thing we have observed in the albumin secretion. Uh, now we have tested the sensitivity of the model with the uh, hepatotoxic uh, drug 10 millimolar hepatotoxic drug so we can see that this uh, drug is uh, toxic for the liver cells so liver cells are dying at each passing day we can see with the uh, red, uh, red color images of red color are the uh, dead cells and green colors are the uh, live cells. Uh, with urea analysis of uh, 10 millimolar um, uh, this acetaminophen can show that the uh, the uh, urea secretion has uh, became half uh, uh, we have done the comparison without drug and with the drug so first um, for the, for the first time we have developed this membrane free liver on a chip platform which not only uh, uh, overcoming the challenges of uh, the mem membrane this tissue this can also uh, act as a 3d liver tissue chip so this pgd hydrogel is not only providing the 3d micro environment to the cells but also protecting the uh, cells from the shear stress of flow so um, I would like to thank my uh, thesis supervisor Professor Shri Shiva Kumar and our collaborator Professor Sandeep Parma and group and I would like to thank my lab mates and my seniors. Finally I would like to thank IIT Kanpur for all the funding and support. Thank you so much. Thank you. So with that uh, we move on to the last speaker for today. Do we have him here? Okay here here. Okay. So. Um, She's the last speaker. Go ahead. Yeah. She's a BTEC student. She's an undergraduate student. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Pradhama Chaudhary, and today I will be presenting my MyTEX internship that I did in last summer. So, I did this project under Chantal Gulamith in her pharmacogenomics lab and uh, it was in University Laval, Quebec City, Canada. 
so the topic for my internship was to identify potential substrate of ugt 2b17 and ugt 2b28 enzymes so let us look at what are ugt enzymes so ugt stands for uridine diphosphate glycoside transferase enzymes so they uh, they catalyzes the glucuronidation reaction in which they add the sugar molecule from udp uh, uh, UDP sugar donor to variety of fun uh, functional groups that are carboxylic, amine group and uh, hydroxyl group and uh, endogenous toxic metabolites. They ultimately forms glucuronides that are inactive and water soluble. So they perform a special function in human body elimination process and they maintain cellular homeostats that they maintain the concentration of uh, metabolites in our human body and they detoxify the xenobiotics and clearance of used drugs so even though they are well known for their uh, uh, process in elimination process but they are very le less systematic in cell metabolome studies that are available and many of these UGT enzymes do not have any specific substrates, uh, substrates known so the objective of my project was to analyze the mass spec data, uh, systematic and cell metabolome and find out some specific substrate for UGT2B17 and UGT2B28 enzymes. So the methodology that I followed was I analyzed the mass spec data of, uh, from three different data sets. First one was from uh, cell lines. So in cell line we had MEC1 cell line uh, that is specific for uh, mental cell lymphoma and GVM2 cell line which is known for uh, uh, CLL, cell, uh, CLL disease and LNCAP cell line which is a prostate cancer cell line. So MEC1 and GVM2 cell line are known for their overexpression in UGT2B17 whereas LNCAP cell line is known for their overexpression of UGT2B28. And the second uh, data set that, was, that I had was from plasma of prostate cancer patient and there was two types of data. First one having germline deletion of UGT2B17 and the other one ha had the germline deletion of UGT2B28. The third data set was from plasma of Canadian longitudinal study on aging. So this data set was from cohort of Canadian population that were healthy and they uh, voluntarily give their plasma for scientific uh, research and their bodily checkup. So in this data set, there was knockout of UGT2B17 and UGT2B28. So the whole mass spec metabolomic data was of two types, n targeted data set that in which no metabolites are targeted. And the another data set was from lipidomic where specific lipid molecules were targeted. So to search for potential substrate of UGT2B17, I analyzed data set from GVM2 cell line and MEC1 cell line which are known for their overexpression of UGT2B17 and in this data set I looked for metabolites that were down regulated and uh, similarly from the plasma of prostate cancer which was having knockout of UGT2B17 I looked for metabolites that were up regulated. In this way I came up with a uh, uh, shortlisted list of potential substrate for UGT to be 17 and from and, uh, from literature review I collected more evidences that that suppose that uh, that supports that they needs to be eliminated from my body so further I went for performing glucuronidation reaction and then by mass spectrometry uh, it will confirm whether they are substrate of UGT to be 17 or not. So in this way, the one metabolite that I found out was quinolinate. And similarly, I looked for potential substrate of UGT to be 28. I looked for metabolites that were downregulated in L encapsule line. And from this shortlisted list, I looked for metabolites that were upregulated in the plasma of prostate cancer patient and CLSA which were having knockout of UGT2B28 and similarly I made the list of potential substrate for UGT2B28 and evidences were collected from literature that supports that these could be the potential substrate of UGT2B28. Mass spec was done that uh, give us the result whether they are potential substrate or not. So in this way I came up with n acetyl neuraminate as the potential substrate of UGT2B28. So 
this is the design experimental design for enzymatic assay and it was done for to check whether glucuronidation is happening in the uh, by these enzymes on these substrate or not so in the master mix uh, microsomes from liver kidney and intestine was added and quinolinate for and n acetyl neuraminate uh, were added and uh, one uh, positive control was made so dht is known that it is uh, that it uh, that is the substrate of ugt to be 28 which is ugt to be 17 which is found in liver microsomes whereas three negative control were, na were made and all were kept for overnight incubation and then methanol was added to stop the reaction and then mass spectrometry was done uh, similarly, I found it out these lipid molecules as the potential substrate of UGT to be 17 and like spingolipid and some uh, lipids from LPC ester and LPE ester were found out as the potential substrate of UGT to be 17 and for UGT to be 28 similarly uh, PE ester and n glutamate and spermin were found out as the potential substrate. So in conclusion, I would like to say I found it out cunilinate and n neuraminate as the potential substrate for UGT to be 17 and UGT to be 28 as their potential substrate respectively. And I found it out six lipid molecule and one lipid molecule as a potential substrate for UGT to be 17 and UGT to be 28. And the future for prospect for this uh, would be that it will that it for the first time a potential substrate was founded for UGT to be 28 and this will allow us to check the enzymatic assay for UGT to be 17 and 28 enzymes and it will also provide us an indirect way to confirm or to validate the overexpression of UGT to be 28 and uh, prostate cancer and bladder cancer cell lines. So at the end, I would like to thank uh, my text program, the professor that supported me for this uh, internship. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Gudima. So uh, with this, uh, we come to the end of this last session. And I want to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, Dr. Shamik Shen, Dr. Jayantan Rao, Aman Nikhil, Rafat Ali, Preeti, Sati, and uh, Ridhima. So please join me in thanking all these speakers. So we have uh, actually gained some time in this session. Um, but uh, I was informed that uh, yesterday there was some uh, shortage of time for discussion on abstracts. Uh, so we will uh, close this session right now and start the tea session as well as the abstract session parallelly right now, right after this. So we break for tea right now. And uh, um, you want to, yeah, yeah you, she has a small announcement uh, regarding uh, NGO that her father runs. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chitral, and uh, I'm part of this NGO, which is a wildlife and environment protection NGO called the Junglies. And we have recently launched this anti-plastic campaign so uh, we are collecting signatures from educational institutes across the country and uh, I request you all to please take out your precious time and sign this petition which will be given to the Prime Minister and uh, I'll be really grateful if you can support me in this noble cause. Thank you. Uh, so these forms uh, will be kept at the registration desk. So uh, if you could just uh, sign uh, with your names and uh, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. So we now break for tea and all students who have their posters to be presented, please go ahead first put up your poster and then pick up a cup of tea.
We've had two days of wonderful sessions over here, great talks, greater food to eat, and some really amazing uh, discussion sessions, etc. And uh, it's been a really wonderful two days of inauguration uh, celebrations. Now we come to the end of uh, the two day celebration and we'll end it on a high note. So we'll have announcement of the poster session awards and all the prizes won by the students. So, uh, and which uh, I'll ask Arjun to take over and do the announcements. But before that, on behalf of all the organizers team, we must thank and acknowledge Arjun for the very smooth running of the entire two day event. He's been behind it all. And uh, so uh, thanks to Arjun and his entire army of very enthusiastic volunteers who've done this great job. So over to you Arjun now. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much, Anjali. That was uh, very, uh, much appreciated. Uh, it has been uh, a long set of two days to ensure things are going fine, but mostly all thanks to the student volunteers who've done a stellar job. Uh, in fact, uh, I um, can't thank them enough. I don't know if everybody's here because they're still stuck doing some scoring and other stuff. So at the end, I really want to call all of them on stage so that they're duly acknowledged. We have a slide that has their faces, but it's really not equivalent to seeing them in person. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, and I really wish that uh, some of them go on to do fascinating things at the center, uh, make their career out of what is coming up here. And I also wish that maybe some of them have realized that they're really good at certain things and can put that on their CV as they, uh, they move on. Um, and also, like a uh, very quick thanks to all the students who've been here for the last two days. Uh, it was the talks were fantastic. Some of them ran a little over time, but it was still fantastic. Um, seeing the kind of work that you're doing in the lab, which we don't get to see otherwise, um, the poster sessions were stupendous. Like I mean, I, it was bustling with activity. It was so good to see so many of you uh, in those halls uh, checking out posters of your friends. And we were thinking we should do more of this uh, at BSB because this is like really good way of interacting, getting to know what that person is doing and all the difficulties that they face doing those experiments, which usually does not come across in like very smooth five minute, 10 minute talks. So we will try to do this more often as we uh, go along. Um, yeah, and also like I was surprised that the, uh, the food uh, sessions, like the lunch and dinner was pretty smooth. I saw students trying to figure out where the highly priced food <laughs> were, but you know, despite all that, it was still very disciplined. Things went on fine, which was, Awesome, thanks so much for all that. Uh, it shouldn't end without thanking the caterers, of course. They, they did a good job of arranging things and uh, setting up multiple counters, made sure that there was no crowding, things were available and uh, on offer till the very end. Um, also want to thank the cleaning staff, uh, you know, for keeping everything clean, maintaining things, uh, being there on call to ensure things went on smoothly. Um, we also had Thermo Fisher as a vendor, like they partly supported some of the activities that are going on uh, during the event. They had a stall out there. Some of you probably visited that and saw some of the cutting edge new uh, you know, tools that they had on display over there. Um, one more, uh, the, the CIS guards, I mean, you can't really, I mean, all of this happened very smoothly. We were very happily enjoying the event and moving around at like odd hours at the night, all because of the sense of safety and security that they could provide uh, during this time. So with all that done, I wanted to, uh, I mean, of course, uh, uh, you know, thanks to all the organizers and we, uh, you know, it wouldn't have happened without the center, without, uh, you know, all of you all coming together. So um, can't thank you all enough. With that, I want to move on to something that we do every year as part of the department. We hand out certificates of appreciation to students who've actually got poster awards or travel awards, uh, published innovative work, uh, you know, uh, got their patents accepted and so on. So this is what we do normally. So I'm going to call on the PI and the PI hands over the certificate to the students. So we'll do that. And then we'll move on to 
the next segment will be uh, where we actually announce the winners of the quiz bowl from yesterday. So that will be exciting. We'll give out the certificates to the winners from the quiz, uh, quiz bowl. Uh, we also have had a good response for the posters as I was talking about. So we'll give out poster awards right after that as well. So uh, you, know, you can wait with anticipation to see who the winners are while we give out the certificates for the different labs. Um, all right. So we'll get started. I'm going to move the slides and call on the PIs. So the first uh, PI I would call on is uh, Professor Nitin Mohan. You can come on stage. And I'll also check if the back room team is ready with the certificates to give out. Yeah. Uh, so the first one goes to Deepak. <laughs> so this is the best poster award that he got at IIT Madras for the annual PMRF Symposium. This is the Prime Minister's Research Fellowship Symposium. Uh, the next one goes to Rachita. Rachita, if you're here. So this is a travel assistance or travel fellowship that she got for uh, attending the European Drosophila Research Conference. Uh, next, I'll call on stage, uh, since Arvindan is not here, uh, Nitin has accepted to give out the awards for his lab members. Um, so thanks, Nitin. Uh, so the first one goes to Chitral. Chitral, are you here? Yeah. Uh, so she gets one for a SCRB travel grant to attend a TB drug discovery development in GRC, Spain. She gets another travel grant for attending, um, resulted in the GRC travel grant for attending the same thing, discovery and development. I don't know what's different there, but looks like there are two. Okay, thanks, Chitral. Okay, the next one goes to Hari Haran. So this is in contribution to a research project that resulted in the following pattern. A formulation for innovation of SARS-CoV-2 infection and process for preparing uh, the drug uh, dose thereof. Awesome. Thank you, Nitin. I'll let you go now. Uh, next up on stage is uh, Dr. Santosh Mishra. So we're going to call Niranjan Chatterjee. Tina Watts. So Niranjan has got three awards. So one for his contribution to a research project that's resulted in the following publication. Nanocarbon enforced anisotropic <laughs> MUSCAM LR for rapid rescue of mechanically damaged skeletal muscles. He gets a certificate in recognition of contribution to a project that resulted in the following patent as well, which is the SARS CoV 2 uh, process, inhibition of SARS CoV 2. Fantastic. And he also gets a third best poster award for uh, attending the Society of, for Biomaterials Artificial Organs. Awesome. So next uh, is, uh, next up is Piyush. Piyush has a long way to come. <laughs> so Piyush has been awarded for his contribution that resulted in the following publication in the Journal of Biochemical Engineering. So the font size is small, I apologize for that, but I can read that out very quickly. Color changing redox active paper stamps called CoRAPS for quick and easy detection of bacterial infection. So that's what he's done. Uh, next up, Bushra. So Bushra is not here, so Santosh, I'll... Um, 
Thank you. So we have Anjali, Dr. Anjali Yadav. She is not here. Okay. Uh, does anyone want to take it on behalf of her from Bushra's lab? <laughs> so this is for a research project that resulted in the following publication in Cancer Research Communications, I think, um, which is targeting MALATI or one T1 augments sensitivity to PARP inhibition by in, uh, impairing homologous recombination in prostate cancer. Oops. Okay, so the next award goes to Tanay Biswas. So he's already here on stage. So his project resulted uh, in Mehta Rice Engineering Scholars Program from the Bhupat Jyoti Mehta Family Foundation. Okay, now we can go. Uh, Dr. Ashwini Thakur. He's next. Okay. <laughs> so friends of these students can come on stage. So the first up is Nabodita Sena. This is for a research project that has resulted in a publication that has been published in Wiley Plant Journal. Uh, this is for protein reservoirs of seeds. Uh, are amyloid com composites employed differentially for germination and seedling emergence? Okay, she has one more, which is for a short term scientific exchange grant from the European Molecular Bio Biology Organization. And she has one more for uh, a, a travel award for attending the GRC Antimicrobial Peptides Conference in Italy. Great job. Okay. Next up is Shreya Ghosh, Dr. Shreya Ghosh, is she here? Anyone wants to take it for her? Okay. So this is for her contribution to a research project that resulted in a publication in the Indian Journal of Clinical Medicine. So it's targeting renal amy amyloidosis, secondary to monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance in a young Indian patient. Young patient, a case report. This is a case report. Okay, next up, Dr. Shankar. Shankar. So we're calling on stage Mr. Narendra Reddy. This is for a contribution to a research project that resulted in a publication in the journal Proteins. So molecular dynamics studies of CD4, CD9, EGL1, ternary complex reveal CD4 release mechanism in linear apoptotic pathway of uh, C. elegans. The next one goes to Ms. Rachana Dande. Are you here? Okay, she's not here, so there's someone else to collect it for her. Uh, this is in recognition of a project that resulted in a publication in database journal in 2023. DBAQP, SNP, a database of missense single nucleotide polymorphisms in human aquaculture. Thank you, Shankar. Next up is Samitaba. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one will be Pankaj, the development paper will be Pankaj. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So this is the first one goes to uh, Akrit Pran Jaswal. He's probably not here uh, for this publication in osteoarthritis and cartilage in 2023. So, Fauzia is going to accept it on his behalf. Mm -hmm. 
BMP signaling, a significant player and therapeutic target for osteoarthritis. Second one goes to Bupender Kumar in the recognition of his contribution to a, a project that led to uh, publication, uh, again in osteoarthritis and cartilage in 2023. Same paper. Same paper. Bupender also got the best presentation award uh, for a SOAR SOAR Con conference in 2023 with the theme National Conference with Global Perspectives on Osteoarthritis. <laughs> Next up is Tathagat Biswas. Pankaj. Pankaj is going to collect it for him. <laughs> Pankaj is also an author in the paper. Okay. He's also an author in the paper, in the same paper, in development 2023. This is on molecular mechanism of synovial joint site specification and induction in developing vertebrate limbs. And Upendra Yadav for uh, the same paper, Joint Trust Office. Awesome. Next up, Chiraki. <coughs> We'll take it for her. Okay, awesome. So the first one goes to Niveda in recognition of her work that resulted in a publication in development 2023. CNKSR2. A downstream mediator of retinoic acid signaling modulates the RAS RAF MEK pathway to regulate patterning and imagination of the chick for brain roof plate. She's an author on the She's also an author on the paper. As well. And Vedo also gets a travel award uh, for traveling to the Congress of International Society of Developmental Biologists. <laughs> Next up, Nathan. Could you please ask people to confirm that could you please get from that source? Confirm it. Oh, from those sites because it will be easier to get them. I think it is. Sure, sure. Oh, Nathan is here. Um, so the first one goes to Arka Ghosh. He is not here. He, he is in the US. He is in the US, uh, but someone else will accept it for him. Uh, this is awarded in uh, con uh, for his contribution to a research project that resulted in the following publications: uh, publication in JMIR Serious Games 2023. <laughs> Serious Games based on cognitive bias modification and learned helplessness paradigms for the treatment of depression. Design and acceptability study. One more. So this is also to Arka Ghosh uh, for his work that resulted in another publication, Journal of Medicine Internet Research. Yeah. That has already been taken. <laughs> so uh, next up is Pranjul. Pranjul is also not here, right? She's also in the US. She's also in the US. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, for her work that's resulted in the publication in Nature Communications in 2023. Uh, this is for combinatorial encoding of odors in mosquito antennal lobe. Okay. Um, next up is Ashok. Right. So first up is uh, Mr. Aman Nikhil for his work that resulted in the fellowship award I, uh, ICS ICRS, if I'm correct, 2023, the Indian Cartilage Society and the International Cartilage Regeneration and Joint Preservation Society. He also gets a DBT -C, uh, CTEP travel grant for attending the Tissue Engineering Regenerative Medicine International Society, the European chapter in 2023 in Manchester, UK. 
नेक्स्ट आप इस डॉक्टर अंकिता दास यू कैन आल्सो कम फ्रॉम दिस साइड दैट माइट बी फास्टर इफ यू वांट एंड दिस इज फॉर अ प्रोजेक्ट दैट रिजल्टेड इन द बेस्ट ओरल प्रेजेंटेशन अवार्ड फ्रॉम द इंटरनेशनल academy of cardiovascular sciences and international society for heart research in 2023 she has one more travel award scrb sponsored travel award for attending the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine international society <laughs> european chapter meeting 2023 in manchester uk next up is dr ankita mishra in recognition of her contribution to a project that resulted in the following patent she is not here i guess she is also part of the inventors list okay uh next i think i went back yeah so next up is ekta shivastava This is for a project that resulted in the best oral presentation award from BJO Remedy 2022. Oh, bio. Okay, bio remedy. <laughs> Interesting choice of fonts. <laughs> Next also goes to Ekta Shivasa for her publication in Carbon Journal in 2023. A reduced graphene oxide functionalized electrospun nerve wrap, amal amalgamating electrical and biochemical cues to enhance nerve regeneration in the median injury model. <laughs> Next is Irfan Kayum. See here. Okay, she is a co-author on this, so she is going to take this as well. in recognition of the project that resulted in the following publication in biomaterials advances anti infective composite cryogel scaffold treats osteomyelitis and augments bone healing in the rat femoral condyle another one for ifan that ekta is going to take so in recognition of contribution to a project that resulted in the following patent um too hard to read from here but anti uh, it's an antibiotic loaded composite bone active biomaterial and for the process of its synthesis fantastic next up prerna singh dr prerna singh this is for her contribution that resulted in the following publication in the chemical engineering journal in 2023 functionally multifaceted scaffolds delivering bioactive compounds for the treatment of infectious chronic and ischemic wounds next up ms ritu gupta in in recognition of her contribution to a research project that resulted in the following publication in the journal of functional biomaterials in 2023 Okay, so she happens to be an M Tech student as well. So fantastic. <laughs> Establishing the callus-based isolation of extracellular vesicles from cystis quadrangularis and elucidating their role in osteogenic differentiation. <laughs> Next up, Dr. Rupita Ghosh for her publication in Chemical Engineering Journal in 2023. This is for machinable. Diopside lanthanum phosphate composite ceramics for fabricating load-bearing bone implants. Next up is Dr. Sneha Gupta for her contribution to a research project that resulted in the following publication in ACS Applied Materials Interfaces in 2023. Exosome functionalized. drug laden bone substitute along with an antioxidant herbal membrane for bone periosteum regeneration in bone sarcoma she has one more okay she knows no two more okay <laughs> uh this is for winning the 
A W S A R. Avsar. Avsar. Okay. Award for the best science story from the Department of Science and Technology. She gets another one, which is for the first runner-up award uh, from the Dr. K V Rao Scientific Society, Hyderabad, India. Awesome. Okay, next one goes to Dr. Shazia Asghar Sheikh. She was on stage earlier. In recognition of her contribution to a research project that resulted in the following publication in the Chemical Engineering Journal. This is the one that I had mentioned earlier, in which Rukita had also got the award. She gets one more for a publication in my uh, bio macromolecules 2023. <laughs> this one's going to be hard to read for me. Strontium substituted nano hydroxy incorporated polylactic acid composites for orthopedic applications, bioactive, machinable, and high strength properties. Awesome. She gets one more for a patent, uh, which is yeah, the synthesis of the hydro nano hydroxy appetite and the laser assisted synthesis of nano hydroxy appetite. <laughs> <laughs> Good, that way I'll get to know more. So, yeah. Okay, next up is Triya Sahab for best poster pitching award at the International Conference on Biomaterials, Regenerative Medicine and Devices, Bioremedy 2022. This time without <laughs> So I'm told that a couple of certificates did not get printed. So this is probably the end of this one. Oh, we still have a couple. Okay. Yeah, but do you want me to read yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Dr. Pradesh right now. Okay. So, a couple of certificates did not get printed, unfortunately, but we'll still award them as soon as we get them made in person. But we still would like to read out the citation at least. This is for Mahima Bharti in recognition of her contribution to a research project that resulted in a paper in PNAS um, from uh, Pradeep Sinha's lab. How do I do that? Over there. <laughs> so if they can just uh, if Pradeep is here, if Pradeep is here, we should also call him on stage. Is he here? Yeah. Okay. So if you can, uh, some Anjali. professor should congr congratulate. Mahima Bharti and Jyoti Tripathi. Yeah, it's hard to put it on this slideshow here to show, but that's a. <laughs> We're just staging a picture now. <laughs> awesome. So we have one more that we couldn't print. This is for, for uh, Jyoti Tripathi. She's here. Also from Pradeep Slab, she gets uh, the award for winning the Avsar Award for Best Science Story in the PhD category by DSC. Awesome. So next up is Dhirendra. Give back the award. Thanks, Amitabha. Uh, first up is uh, Mr. Aman Mahajan for uh, his work that has resulted in the following publication in Biomaterials in 2023. Apparently, I could have read this here, but I was craning when I called a while. Um, this is for a paper in Biomaterials 2023 and Converse modulation of wind and beta catenin signaling during expansion and differentiation phases of infrapatellar 
fat pack derived mscs for improved engineering of hyaline cartilage okay. on his behalf is being accepted by okay the next one also goes to aman uh, for his work that resulted in the dbpc pep international travel grant in 2022 for attending uh, for presenting attending and presenting a poster in the 7th bioengineering and translational medicine conference in boston in the us the next one also goes to aman uh, mahajan this is for a project this is a project that resulted in an international travel support from science and engineering research board for attending and presenting a poster in the 7th bioengineering translational medicine conference in boston awesome next up is arijit bhattacharya Okay. Arijit, are you here? No, Arijit is not here. Okay, he's not here. Okay, he's in Assam. So this is uh, okay. There's someone else picking up on his behalf. Arijit's wife has delivered. Okay, <laughs> congratulations to him. Uh, double congratulations. Double congratulations. So this congratulations is for the. Uh, publication in carbohydrate polymers so there's one more for arijit okay so it has to be triple uh, in recognition of his contribution to a research project that resulted in the following patent uh, a, com a combination comprising sulfated carboxy methyl cellulose and a tissue inhibitor of metalloprotease 3 that is tim3 tim3 for osteoarthritis in 2023 for oh, this one more uh, this is for arijit again for a project that resulted in the following patent another patent a combination of anti catabolic and pro anabolic agents for the treatment of osteoarthritis thank you thank you thank you uh, next up is mr nadeem ahmed Nadeem has graduated. Oh, Nadeem has graduated. Somebody okay. <laughs> so, this is for his contribution to a research project that resulted in a patent for a highly stable therapeutic protein antigen having vaccine application against shigellosis and a simple cost-effective method for preparing the same. that was awarded in 2023 next up is miss namrata barua namrata is also graduate namrata is also not there she has pointed <laughs> so um, this is for her contribution to a research project that resulted in the following publication in journal of nanobiotechnology in 2023 facile synthesis of multifaceted biomimetic and cross protective nanoparticle based vaccines for drug resistant shigella a flexible platform technology next one also goes to her for a contribution to a research project that resulted in a patent shigella nano vaccine and process for synthesis there one more for her which is another patent highly stable therapeutic protein antigen having vaccine application against shigellosis and simple cost effective method for preparing the same one more for her which is her contribution to a project that resulted in the bachpai saha award in bio remedy conference at iit guwahati in december 2022 fantastic some weight left to do okay uh this one more uh this is a certificate awarded to neha arya she here no she is long graduate okay she is graduate this is an old patent which got okay i see it came to okay awesome so in recognition of a contribution to a project that resulted in the following patent a method for tumoroid generation using 3d kytosan gelatin scaffolds for anti cancer drug screening next up is mr nihal singh is going to be yeah <laughs> yes. he's a graduate sorry 
This is for a publication in Life Science in 2023. Life Sciences targeting multiple disease hallmarks using syner synergistic disease modifying drug combination ameliorates osteoarthritis via inhibition of senescence and inflammation. The next next up is Prashant Jha. Okay, also going to be taken by also her. Graduated. Also graduated. <laughs> so this is for a patent, a method for tumoroid generation using 3D chitosan gelatin scaffolds for anti-cancer drug screening in 2023. Okay. okay. There's one more for Sarang. I don't have the on my. Okay, it's changing the technology now. Okay, this is a certificate awarded to Sarang Dukhada in recognition of his contribution to a research project that resulted in the following pattern. <laughs> Sulfated carboxy methyl cellulose functionalized electrospun fibers for electrostatic immobilization of cat cationic molecules in 2023. Uh, next one goes to Sriram M in recognition uh, of a research project that resulted in the same pattern. Next up is again for the same pattern or the earlier one that we were talking about, which is Mr. Viren Sardana. Very good. Next up is my, me, myself. So yeah, I can do the announcements. For you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. The first one goes to Mr. Harsh Arora. In recognition of his contribution to a research project that resulted in the AMBO Travel Award. Next one goes to Mr. Kshitij Kumar. Kshitij? Somebody else can come? Yeah. This was for uh, Kshitij's contribution to a research project that resulted in a travel award to uh, Deutsch. Now this is German, so it's challenging. I think the acronym is good, DFG. <laughs> uh, next uh, is for uh, Ms. Piyusha Mitra. In recognition for her contribution to a research project that resulted again in a travel award by EMBO. Next is Promit Moitra <laughs> for his contribution to a research project that resulted in again in the travel award by IIC and Pratiksha Trust. Okay. Now you're back. Thank you. You're back in business. <laughs> yeah. I think we missed some more changes. I could very quickly check I and take. Uh, I don't think we got the uh, certificates from Jaindran sir. Uh, okay, we'll we'll look that up. We'll fix this. Okay. I don't have the names actually. Oops. Check in this. I'll just quickly check the shared folder once, so we are able to do this on the spot. For some reason, I couldn't get it. I to oh, I see. Okay. So we got it. So Jayendran, I think you should come up on stage. <laughs> so it's not going to be flashed up here, but we'll still award the person. <clears throat> 
So this is a uh, certificate awarded to Burton Mary in recognition of her contribution to a research project that resulted in a patent. Yeah. Very hard to read. It's a process for generating glyco-engineered AAV vectors for hepatic and ocular gene therapy and the product thereof. Okay. Yeah, how do I go back? Okay, the next one goes to uh, Satya Titan Arumugam. Uh, Satya Titan Arumugam. Okay. In recognition of his contribution to a research project, I'm trying to zoom in for a patent again, which I'm not able to zoom in for some reason. All right. So the the next award goes to Mohit Kumar uh, for his contribution to a research project that also resulted in a patent. I'm going to try to read this for sure. Okay. Identification of microRNA and methods to improve gene expression from AAV vectors. Awesome. Did I miss any others? Okay. So there is uh, one award for the recognition uh, for a project that resulted in a publication for Mohan Kumar BS, if you're here. Yeah, I'm finding it really hard to read the name of the paper because it's too small here and I'm unable to zoom. So pardon me for that, Jay. Okay, so this one goes to Pratiksha Sarangi. Are you here? For a publication in Journal of Cell Cellular Molecular Medicine in 2023, <laughs> potential role of long non-coding RNA H19 and NEAT1 in hemophilic arthropathy. Okay. I think we ran through the list. I don't think we've missed any, have we? Oh, oh, hopefully not. Okay, <laughs> so now um, the next thing I really want to do now is, I don't know if we have the poster award. Do we have the poster award yet? No, okay. So then we'll call on stage the volunteers if they're all available for a quick pick. Can the volunteers come on stage if they're all here? So we also have made a little slide in case they're not available here, that these were all the volunteers that were helping around with the various activities that were happening, including managing the mic, managing the backstage activities, managing, handing the mics around, the sound system, setting up the poster boards. There were people actually physically like carrying around poster boards <laughs> uh, yesterday. And then um, you know, the lunch queues, and plenty of other things. And of course, putting together the list and so on. So maybe like one big round of applause for the volunteers. So, I, like on request from the volunteers, we are calling Nitin and Anjali over to uh, uh, here for a little quick pick with all of us. Amitabha? 
Amitabha, I think you should also join us because this has been the team of four that's been hacking away at different things leading up to the event. And it's only fair to uh, call all of us on stage, call all of them on stage. So, Okay. okay, so uh, we have a couple of things to go before we finalize and close. Uh, one is going to be, and we're still on time, so it's okay. Uh, one is the quiz bowl, so we want to call Shankar on stage to um, give out the quiz awards. So the winning team is Simple Minds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have like freshly minted certificates for them that we're going to dole out. So we have three fourths of the team. So Anik Basak, Ayush Goel, Ananya Sarkar, she's not here, and Ayon Das. Fantastic. <laughs> So, okay. um, so the students, the BTEC students or the dual degree students on campus typically go out and do uh, very innovative projects during the summer. And typically we award them for the work that they have done based on uh, another round of selection that happens uh, within the department. So this time all of this was done by uh, Hameem. So thanks to Hameem for uh, you know, conducting these selection rounds. The, uh, the awards for this summer innovation, so we call this a summer innovation award, and this is sponsored by the Joy Gill Foundation. Uh, they are sponsoring the, uh, the awards for this category, so which is for the innovation that's happening by these students in the department. Uh, a round of applause for that. <laughs> to give out these awards, I was uh, talking to Rahul yesterday and he uh, agreed to be uh, here on stage to give out the awards to these uh, students who've done innovative work. So I call Rahul on stage. <clears throat> So the first first prize goes to Pratyusha, Pratyusha Chakravarti. <laughs> Those of you who were here for the first session of the symposium might have had a chance to see the kind of work that she has done. She also had a poster yesterday. 
Oh, two days. Sorry. Thank you, Rahul. The second prize goes to Riddhima Chaudhary. <laughs> Riddhima had a poster today. I hope a lot of you have had a chance to go look up the poster. If not, it's probably still out there. <laughs> the third prize goes to Kaushik Raj Nanda. Kaushik gave a talk earlier today in the first session in the morning. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. So we are now waiting very eagerly <laughs> for the poster awards. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of work in terms of putting together the scores from different reviewers and figuring out uh, the averages and coming up with the different categories. So we have four categories for these poster awards. <coughs> One given for the BTEC students, one for the master's students. I mean, two awards in each of these categories. So two for BTEC, two for master's, two for PhD, and then two uh, for the RAs, the research assistants, and as well as the postdoctoral students who were part of this uh, poster session. So in all eight awards, we'll give as many as we can based on the evaluations that were done by the students. Yeah, we're still calculating the scores. So that's <laughs> <laughs> so in the meanwhile, if there is any suggestion in terms of how we could, um, I don't know, like one thing uh, we uh, did think of was ways in which we could <laughs> yeah, that's also. I just want to suggest the sure. posters require longer time. I could not do justice looking at all the posters. I apologize to some of you whose posters I can get around to doing it. We, we need absolutely more time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think one hour was too short. And the, uh, I mean, I think people could see like four or five posters because we typically take a lot of time. We spend time talking to the the author and yeah, I've had that experience too. And I did feel that we sort of cut short in terms of time for the posters. That's something that we can not fair at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were also happy that we ended up getting so many posters. So that was another thing that was a positive prediction error for us in terms of um, yeah, initially we were assuming that maybe 50% would actually turn up and present a poster, but the numbers were incredibly high. I think we overall, uh, we had more than 60 posters combined across two days and of which maybe five or six dropped out because they had talks. It's not because they didn't want to present because they had talks and hadn't prepared a poster. They didn't present. So overall, I think there was hundred percent attendance in terms of talks plus posters, which was Fantastic. Definitely, definitely. And uh, yeah, congratulations to all the poster presenters. Um, even these awards are a certificate of appreciation, but by no means is that a comment on the kind of work that you're doing. You have to keep in mind, I mean, disclaimer is that not all of them would have seen all the posters. Not all of them would have, uh, you know, like many of them were in different corners. And so it's possible that it didn't get evaluated like the other posters did. So the awards are a way of increasing the enthusiasm, but are by no means a comment on the kind of work that you're doing. Um, so yeah, by all means, be even more spirited and bring more posters and have more such presentations and it'll be good for all of us. Now I think somebody has to sing. <laughs> oh, there's one. Yeah, Ayush wants to do something. OK.
और रेड आयुष हेलो सो इट्स बीन अ वाइल सिंस आई हैव बीन टू अ स्टेज टू सिंग अ सॉन्ग आई एम अ लिटिल नर्वस बट आई विल ट्राई टू सिंग अ ओल्ड मेडली विच इज इंस्पायर्ड फ्रॉम अ मैसेज दैट आई गॉट फ्रॉम राहुल मेहता एंड द मेहता फैमिली एंड इट्स ओल्ड हिंदी सॉन्ग मेडली एंड आई वुड लाइक यू ऑल टू जॉइन इन विद सिंगिंग इट अलॉन्ग विद मी सो If I get a beat like this, clapping, please. Ek din bik jayega maati ke mool, jag me reh jayenge pyare teri mool. Dujhe ke ho tho ko de kar apne gheet, koi nishani chhod. फिर दुनिया से डोल एक दिन बिक जाएगा माटी के मोल जग में रह जाएंगे प्यारे तेरी बोल ला 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 जिंदगी के सफर में गुजर जाते हैं जो मुकाम वो फिर नहीं आते वो फिर नहीं आते आई लाइक दिस साइंस अलॉट सुबह आती है रात जाती है सुबह आती है रात जाती है यूं ही वक्त चलता ही रहता है रुकता नहीं एक पल में ये आगे निकल जाता है आदमी ठीक से देख पाता नहीं और पर्दे पे मंजर बदल जाता है एक बार चले जाते हैं जो दिन रात सुबह शाम सॉरी वो फिर नहीं आते वो फिर नहीं आते एंड वन मोर सॉन्ग इफ यू गाइस अलाउ मी टू मान अपनी जेब से फकीर हैं फिर भी यारो दिल के हम अमीर हैं मान अपनी जेब से फकीर हैं फिर भी यारो दिल के हम अमीर हैं के मर के भी किसी को याद आएंगे किसी की धड़कनों में मुस्कुराएंगे कहेगा फूल हर कली से बार बार जीना इसी का नाम है थैंक यू सो मच इट वॉज ऑसम वेरी रिलैक्सिंग एट द एंड ऑफ द एंड ऑफ द डे ट्रॉल रनिंग राइट वेरी इंस्पायरिंग यस नाउ वी वॉन्ट मोर <laughs> even more but i think apparently the scores have been put together so i think we should have it very quickly and then uh, what follows is actually the students some selected students have dinner with scientists with uh, professor gangbao and professor shankar at the uh, visitor hostel one in the new dining hall so as soon as you're done from here to the students mainly <laughs> uh, please head over to vh1 Uh, in case you haven't got the email from us this is um, this is the time so 7:45 is when the dinner is yeah those yeah those who have been notified so we've actually collected responses and <laughs> sent emails to those students can i ask for two things because you know potential time tech sabko chogi mtech ko category okay sure 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 okay i'm going to say a few names can you tell if you are a मास्टर्स और अ पी एच डी स्टूडेंट मोह चंद्र पॉल अंकिता जयसवाल अरे शेट 
आदित्य आदित्य लादा संदर्भ कुमार मनीष कुमार हो गया so yeah so this is the official name enough you want to follow names no i think this is cool. i'll just call on stage i think i'm going to call on stage so we finally have the the list of winners so that's fantastic i know they were under a lot of pressure to put this together the last minute so a big round of applause to them <laughs> um next up i want to call on stage nitin uh to give out the poster awards come on nitin <laughs> so as i said we have four categories two awards in each these are both best poster awards so there's no rank 1 and 2 um the award for the btech category goes to uh, dev bharbai Do you see how quickly we made the certificates? <laughs> the the second award for the beta category goes to Ridhima Chaudhary. In the M Tech category, uh, one of the awards goes to Amal Amal Jude Ashwin, the guy with the secular name. <laughs> This the next poster award goes to Manish Manish Kumar Bharti. Next up is the PhD category. Uh, these actually had the most number of posters. So uh, one award goes to Pratiksha, Pratiksha from Jaisla. The second one goes to Ubed, Ubed Sare. So last off we have the postdoc RA category. Uh, one of the awards goes to Dr. Deepthi Chub. All the chocolate. All the chocolate. <laughs> The uh, next award goes to Dr. Garima Chauhan. fantastic so that brings us to the close in terms of all the awards and other certificates that we had to hand out um also brings us to the end of the research symposium inauguration of the building etc etc it feels like the buildings become much more livelier over the last two days which is just fantastic looking forward to shifting my lab here and start using all the facilities and you know being in this hall etc some of the, some of my students are already dreaming of doing their PhD defenses here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, with that, I think I should bring this session to a close. 
um, no important announcements as of now, except for those students who've been asked to, uh, have been selected for the dinner, head over for that. For the rest of you, you have your night to yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Those who got the certificates for the poster awards, meet Chetan if you want your names inscribed on it. <laughs>